and we should be live now. Now, okay, hi, uh, we seem to be back. Sorry for the little interruption. So John, uh, you might not have realized, but uh, I was supposed to send a broadcast message to the dev track and I submitted it to the gen track instead. So I spoke over you for like 20 seconds. I apologize humbly, deeply and sincerely. But you John, uh, I have to, I have apologized. Now I will say hi to you. How are you doing? Hello, I'm doing good. I know I'm just saying you harmonized with me. You didn't talk over me, you, you talked with me. You know, I, as much as I would like to say, yes, that is possible, the fact that I did not have the sounds on your talk makes it very difficult for me to harmonize. You know, it's like, try to have a, a, a you know, barbershop quartet and they cannot hear one another. Try try to call, tell them to harmonize. I'm not sure if it's going to work. <laughs> I sang, actually sang in a barbershop uh, chorus for a while and I, I, I know the pain that you're talking about. But anyway, it's <laughs> water under the bridge. Yes, um, what a serendipitous discussion. I wasn't expecting this. Okay, um, do you have the pad open in front of you. Do you want me to read the question or do you want to take them on your own? I'd be glad to do it. Um, right. All right, I'm just going to go start from the top here. I have not only one config, but multiple configs in different locations. .emacs, .el, .emacs, .dnet, .el, and different Python installs in different places. This is something I should take care of earlier rather than later. I need to pay someone to consult on my config. Is this an existing business? Is there a place to barter a screen share for, uh, for something else, a value in exchange? In any case, thank you for giving permission to have fun without the need for too much structure. That's And that's, yeah, I, I, I feel humbled being asked this. Um, I don't know how much insightful answers I can give here other than the fact that I, I did notice um, one of the talks that I really wanted to catch and resonate with was um, the Emacs Buddy initiative. Um, that was actually one of the points that I wanted to, to include in my talk, but it turned out that 10 minutes goes by incredibly fast when you when the ideas are flowing. Um, and I think that that's, that's probably one of the best advice that it, to uh, sources is to, to find some kind of buddy um, who probably would be a great, especially someone who is, who is um, maybe at a similar or, or even a different uh, experience or comfort level. Um, may be able to, you know, be a good exchange of value there. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, and again, that's something I'll think about more. Um, I might not come up with the most interesting answers live. Um, oh, it's fine. Don't worry. You know, you, you don't have to worry about making the most exhaustive answer. You know, the whole point of, uh, sorry, let me move myself to the left. Okay, never mind. I'm trying my best to composite the shot live. Um, yeah, you don't have to worry about making very exhaustive answer right now. Also, we have about 11 minutes. Uh, we might open up the chat. You have a lot of questions, so I think a lot of people are very interested. I think, you know, when you have the arguments that you're trying to valorize the box standard user of Emacs, I think everyone is feeling uh, very invested into the talk and might want to ask questions. So uh, I'm giving you a heads up, people. If you Now is the last chance you have. We are the last talk of the day, barring the closing remarks. If you have questions to ask, now is the time to join BBB. We'll be opening it in two minutes. And in the meantime, John, feel free to go back to the question and answer as many as you can. Thank you. And I would I would love to talk about this with people in the community for, forever. So this is not the last chance to talk about it. Um, all right. How would you suggest Emacs developers, including package developers, interface with non-developer users and get their insights to help in shaping future Emacs functionality? Um, hmm. You know, I, th I think uh, I've seen a lot of discussion on the mailing lists where this kind of um, exchange is, is wanted. Um, you know, I think this is one of those things that may, it may always be difficult um, because I, I've, you know, I have some participation on, on both sides of this if there are sides to it. Um, and I think that most people agree that there's maybe could be, could be a more tighter communication. Um, so I don't think there's anybody out there who, who thinks that, that um, there's work to be done here. There, there's definitely effort that should be dedicated here. But it seems to me like like it's happening. I mean, this you know this the, the survey Emacs survey was developed pretty closely from what I could see with with the core maintainers. Um, so I think that um, it's out there. I mean, maybe perhaps the mailing list is a good good place to start. Um, the several ones of them. I think that you'll certainly get an answer. Um, and hope and hope hopefully it will start a dialogue that that can continue. Um, all right, next one. My impression that many common Emacs users are migrating to other editors in past years. The reasons cited are configurations growing out of control, general rough around the edges feel of Emacs that they've been putting up with for a while, and maybe this isn't new. As a result, Emacs is be up, becoming home to a smaller set of people. 
more invested? Do you share this observation? So what do I think of the trend? And I'm sorry that I was talking over your editing there. I hope I didn't pressure you into to stopping. Um, I mean, my, my impression has been that, that that's a thing of the past. That was happening. And my impression, I've, I've been using MX for um, something like 25 to, four, to 15 years, depending on exactly when you start counting the time. So it's been a long time for me, and I haven't been very aware of things that whole time. I've become more and more aware and conscientious of the, the, the scene over the years recently. Um, but the, those impressions are that it was getting less um, less usage in past years, but it's it's got I, I think it's been increasing pretty quickly in in recent years, in, increasing at a at a pretty high rate. Um, so I, I don't I don't necessarily disagree that there are different sets of people within the Emacs community who may whose usages may be changing, and maybe certain sets of within the community are shrinking and um, their investment levels are changing, um, but my my up until now, I, if you had asked me, I would have I would have said that the max user base was growing, um, changing, and and the usage of what they were what they were counting on was would would have becoming uh, you know more towards the popular um, maybe away from what the core user base would have would have focused on previous to that, um, but. Um, yeah, overall, it seems to me like it's growing, and I think that where we are here and what, and everyone who's gathered here today is is evidence of that. Um, and what do I think of that trend? Um, I mean, I, I I'm happy about it. I I think I mean I one of the things that I didn't have a chance to focus too much on in the talk was was the power of that vanilla out of the box experience. I am a Viper, happy Viper user. I don't think there really are many others that I, at least ones that I know about. And they, may, they just may be the people that I was describing in my talk. They may be out there using Viper happily, and they're the and they're dark matter. They're there, and they make up maybe a, a huge amount of the universe, but you just maybe can't it, it can't feel their effect. Um, but you know, I think that the tr I'm glad that that usage is growing if it is. Um, but I also would hope that people continue to value that out of the box vanilla experience because I think that it gets it's easy to overlook and I think it probably does get overlooked um, and that may just be a necessary consequence of the fact that when things become popular um, when things grow in popularity they are um, what gets focus and what gets coverage is those things that are more receptive and lend themselves better to to popularity. Um, and that's not necessarily the same as the things that are the most. Um, it's not everything is, is really all I can say. There's more. There's always more to it than that. Um, so I hope that as popularity grows, people won't forget um, those things, and those things will stay uh, sure. stay useful for everyone. Um, yeah. Should I do the last one, or should I stop? Oh, uh, yeah. I, I might have some comments on this if no one shows up afterwards. But for now, yes, feel free to answer the last question. Okay. Do you consider that using one of the starter packages, Doom, Emacs, Space Max, et cetera, affect that learning process that you mentioned, or is it a good thing from your perspective? You know, that was another thing I wanted to mention in a talk that I didn't, that my 10 minutes uh, didn't allow, or maybe just the way that I talk in those 10 minutes didn't allow. I, I wanted to just acknowledge the fact that I don't have experience with them. Um, I've been using GNU Emacs since, since I started using Emacs. Um, I, I think they solve a problem for people. I think they have a place, um, but you know, I think I, I think I, some of the thoughts that I had been forming that I wasn't able to put in there about these was that you need to start wherever it gets comfortable for you. And I think that no matter what you use, whatever you start with, um, I think you you always get to the point where you feel like you've entrenched yourself in mindset or a set of habits that you use and you think it's, you want to change, you know that you should be able to change and grow, um, but you've just become accustomed to what you do. And I think that if, if using a starter package and gets you to it anymore, if using a starter, oh, package, sorry, <laughs> if using a starter package gets you over that initial, you know, gets you into the things, if you feel like it's it's going to limit your growth later on, I don't think it's necessarily because of what you chose. It's just that that's that's just the feeling that everybody's going to feel eventually. Um, yep. Yeah. So 
So, uh, so, sorry, John, I was talking with production. Are we, are you finished with the questions? It seems that you are, yeah? Uh, yes, I believe I am. And I will, again, Great. I will try to add better thoughts to these later on the pad. Yeah, but that's fine. I think you did a, a bang up, uh, no, bang up. I, I'm French. I, I don't know if a bang up job is a good job. Can you confirm it for me? Yes, thank you. I appreciate that. Cool, thank you. So it seems like we have Bob uh, on for a question. So Bob was the speaker for the Hyperbole talk, Hyperorg talk earlier today. So Bob, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you great. Uh, and we can hear see. you as well. What are your questions? Can you see me? Let's see if I'll... Uh, we cannot see you yet, though. OK, yeah, I just started, started sharing. Um, so I wanted to ask you, I mean, one of the things we, we really suffer from uh hyperbole we we have this this issue uh that we try to make things as easy to use as possible you know right just point and click uh, press this button and the magic happens uh but because we are dealing with a domain that has a lot of complexity to it we find like you're saying people have always done something a certain way they they bring whatever um processes with them that they've used before so it it feels like there's m uh, a much heavier barrier to get regular users on board than there really should be from what we think we're producing in the software so i wanted to get your perspective about what you think that might be and you know ways we could we could pursue tackling that mm -hmm. And by regular users, you mean ones who have who already had a lot of time and and Emacs support. users who are not developers, not just not Emacs developers, but maybe they're non-technical at all. They, right, sure. but they have to manage everyday information. They do emails, they do, uh, you know, memos and whatever else they're processing. Hmm. You know, I'm not sure um, if. I don't know. This might not answer things uh, to your satisfaction, but I'll, uh, you know, be glad to keep the conversation going. But um, I wonder if one of the things I was thinking of is that very easy to generate. I think a lot of psychic baggage with Emacs um, as you use it over time because you get. You, I think I mentioned this in the talk that you. It's very. It's hard to use it and not be aware of all the different cool functionality set that's built on and the things that you can take advantage of. And part of that is that as you develop your own workflows, you are not only developing them, but you're reject you're for pragmatic reasons rejecting other things. Um, but you don't, you know, you're you're still aware that you've done that and you're aware of all the different possibilities that you're that you've kind of left behind, at least temporarily. Um, I wonder, I think at some point that baggage can impede you. Um, definitely can uh, can make you less uh, open and feel less safe to try new things out, um, especially if those things are, I think sometimes it scales with the more useful and exciting and maybe even, um, well, that's pretty much it. If, if it's going to be exciting or and useful and significantly change things, you could maybe feel extra uh, resistant to try them out because you're not sure that you want to deal with the all that excitement um and sometimes again the more useful it is maybe the more resistant you are um you know in the programming environment you might uh consider the difference between like small talk and c and you know small talk has all this like list but all this great interactive capability but you have the baggage of like carrying this big image around that people mm -hmm. didn't want many years ago when it was popular and c had nothing and still largely has nothing, right? Except you've got Unix uh, there. And and so people like stare at a blank screen, they have no dynamic support, you know, maybe they have tags, but very little tooling. And yet, you know, C dominates over Smalltalk. So I think we're talking about a similar kind of problem that maybe the leap is so far for people that you need to give them a series of between to transition them from their very weak uh, initial environment to you know something much much stronger. That's a yeah, that's a good point, and that's that's actually something that I I think of for myself, and thus something I was thinking about in regards to my talk of when you know that you want to 
like let, like let's consider the, the the kind of user that you're talking about and, and hyperbole. And by the way, I I enjoyed your hyperbole talk, your hyperorg talk, but I'm not up until now I hadn't been familiar with it, so I may say things that don't make any sense. Um, but let's say this user that you're talking about who who you want to become more comfortable with hyperbole. Um, I'll start from the perspective of how they, let's say they know they want to become more comfortable with it, but they also are, are having trouble getting getting comfortable with with that process. Um, and so, I, I mean, that's certainly something I think about, uh, I thought about building for myself uh, and suggesting in this talk of when you know that you want to accomplish something, when you know that you want to change some of your habits, um, to call them out and really, uh, Put your habits on display for yourself, and um, rather than trying to remember them and ingrain them into your your finger muscle memory and all that, is to make some space to have your habits be public, not public necessarily, but just explicit in your environment, um, and al and allow yourself to be uncomfortable with new habits for a while, and that that break out of the habitual space, make it be give yourself some kind of mnemonic structure that lets you. Um, uh, do do these things habitually that will eventually kind of become that that mold into which the habits will grow on top of rather than just trying to go from one set of habits to a new set of habits um, and I think Emacs is one of those things that that's that is great for that because it's the text and especially what you do what you demonstrated in hyperbole and that it seems like it's very easy to just write some text up that can generate for you a, a list a cheat sheet and say I've been using this on the left side. Instead, I want to use this on the right side, or maybe two buffers or something. And you don't have to worry about what it's called. You don't have to worry about how to execute it or, or the key sequence or the function. You can just, um, when you find, you know, one day find yourself, you're using something on the left side, I'd rather use this on the right. Um, and maybe over time you can um, move away from that and try to, try to make it be more automatic. Um, but at least I think maybe the key there is just acknowledging that that your the things that are habitual um, or that you want to become habitual can start um, give yourself training wheels, I guess. Yeah. Right, uh, gents. I'm very sorry. I'm gonna have to pause the conversation now. But ah, uh, don't don't go. Don't leave quite yet. This was a very interesting discussion, and I would love to participate a little more. But we are actually preparing for the closing remarks in the background. But what I'm going to suggest, because I don't want to, I don't want you both to lose steam. And the closing remarks, you can watch them in your own time. We're just going to thank everyone really. So by all means, if you want to continue the discussion, uh, you can stay in a room. We are still going to be recording, and if you want to continue the discussion for as long as you want, it's going to be all good for us. And it just won't be streamed now, but it will eventually be available. Great. Thank you, Leo. Yeah, I mean, all right. Well, thank you so much. Sorry, go on, please. Well, I was just going to say, you know, I, I'd be glad to, or I'd, if people want to go, I'm also glad to go as well. So, really, so That's if you want to join the discussion now, you only have to go to the talk page and you will be able to join there. I'm really sorry, Bob. I'm going to have to end it off in 30 seconds because we need to move to the next room. So, uh, I'll leave, I'll leave you say Bob, bye, Bob, if you want to. Okay. Yeah, I will stay here and talk to whoever wants to everyone. talk. Great. And Bob, do you want to say bye? Bye. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. <laughs> okay. See you in a bit. We'll be closing remarks in about one minute. Okay. Okay. Really sorry for recording short. You are not off stream and you can keep talking and we are recording everything. Okay. See you in a bit. I have to rush. So yeah, again, I, I don't want to hold keep you from the closing remarks. No, I'm saying. happy to talk to you. I think Leo just kept saying, well, you could say, but I have to cut it off. So I guess he was just saying the recording. Um, I, if, I don't care. If you don't mind, let me jump over to, there's another question that someone posted. I just want to make sure I don't ignore that. Um, and then I'll, um, yeah. will the tip of the day package or some elaboration on that idea in Emacs help discovery for lay users? Does that already exist? I, you know, I'm not, I, I can pretty, and I don't know if the person who wrote this is, if it's Plasma Strike, um, <laughs> but hopefully they'll see the recording later. Um, I'm confident in saying that this does exist. I don't know what it is because I, I've never used it. I've never seen it, but I, I know that something like this must exist. So I'm confident in saying that it does. Um, yeah, I haven't seen it either. Yeah. Um, 
it, or if not, I mean, it probably would be something that would be relatively easy to um, make. Not necessarily the person who wants this type right, of data, right, but right. You know, yeah, it's something that I could. I'm, Let, I'm that's kind of interesting. If you put a an org or um, a high rollo uh, file together of all these tips, it, it would be very easy to, uh, yeah, have something on a timer that would just pop one up, you know, every yeah. so often, or, or based on some action. But that's kind of that's kind of an interesting learning technique, you know. That I certainly use that in some other packages where, you know, a lot of times you just X out of it right away. But for things that actually provide useful tips, uh, you tend to read them and linger for a bit, right, before you move yeah. on. And and that's a great way because I mean, after decades of using Emacs, there's definitely packages in Emacs libraries that I've never seen before. I didn't know were there, and you know that I sometimes find useful. So there's always a lot to discover, and that oh, yeah. feature discovery is a a difficult uh, a difficult thing, you know, because uh, that's why we spend a lot of time documenting things. Because uh, like with, with the reference manual, hyperbole about 170 pages. Um, you know, I don't expect people to read the manual, but to use it in info and say, you know, I'm interested in the action button. Okay, I'll just read that action button section. And that's really what it's intended for and why we provide, you know, quick access. Uh, in fact, if you look at the menu structure, uh, the pull down menus for hyperbole, uh, there's just one, you know, uh, pull down menu. And, but the sub menu is under there. Uh, each one has uh, an about or a doc uh, item. And when you click on that, it takes you exactly to the place in the manual uh, discussing the concept that's covered by that menu. So it makes it very easy for people. But I was wondering, you know, if you, I, I think you, you have a lot of good process oriented thoughts. And I'll say, you know, if, if you know who Doug Engelbart is or was uh, I worked with him a bit and he was always focused on you have to evolve your process uh, while you evolve your technology and clearly a lot of the people in the Emacs developer community are sort of focused on the technology which is common right even in corporations and it's always sort of a struggle to get people to try to evolve both at the same time so I'd be interested in sort of conversing along those lines about, you know, we've built, uh, so we've built two levels, I think in hyperbole, we've built the toolkit of primitives that you can build from and, and customize to your own needs. Um, but we haven't uh, done a lot about, and people are always asking, well, what's the workflow that I should use to integrate it with? And we're like, you know, well, what's your knowledge workflow, you know? What, what sort of tasks do you have to do? And then we can tell you something, but it, it is one of those general kinds of things. You know, like I say, I use the K outliner to capture requirements because I want, when I share those requirements with people, I want them to say, you know, well, item 9A, uh, let's edit this this way. Because a lot of times, right, they can't interact with the document uh, that directly or they want me to maintain it. So uh, I find that that everything is numbered that way in any sort of uh, structured uh, ideation process to be extremely valuable. Yeah. And so, uh, but, I, but I think, you know, maybe the, obviously, as you said, you haven't used that, but, and I, I've worked on a lot of other Emacs stuff, but I, I think it'd be valuable, you know, having some discussions with you. Um, to talk about that, you know, perspective from somebody trying to grok something like this or, or, you know, get deeper into Emacs. And uh, I, I always feel like, uh, like I'm developing some new software at work. Um, and our company is kind of moving from being a more consulting company to a technology company. And I say, well, okay, we're doing this big, big set of applications 
uh, where's the uh, market input? The business people kind of wave their hands and say, you know, we want something shiny. Uh, but uh, we never get structured input from the actual clients that will be the users uh, until we build something and put it in their hands. And I'm like, that's too late. You know, yeah. <laughs> we need. Uh, so I think it's sort of true here, too, that it's very hard to just, you know, like if I said, let's just have 10 people who have never uh, tried hyperbole to look at it, go through a process and just write one page on their experience. You know, I think that'd be very hard to get that set of people together in general, you know, without effort, significant effort. It's a good point because you it, the people that would be able to to use it, i.e. people who are already Emacs users for the most part, mm -hmm. they're probably either already busy. familiar with it or, or well, oh. busy too, or, uh, or maybe they have their own ways that they don't, they're, they don't, they might be competent enough to do it, but not comfortable enough to do it or not interested enough to do it. Um, maybe you have the intersection of, of all the different properties would, would might be pretty small. Yeah. But, uh, just, just having those ideas, I think it, it, it helps us, you know, to shape. And I, I feel like we can take what we have and meld it like, like what, if you saw Carl Volt, Volt's, Volt's uh, talk on his bi-directional links, I think that's a super valuable uh, thing that we, you know, we haven't really considered much, um, but people talk about a lot as a result of work, having given them that capability for a while. Um, yeah. That was, yet, Eduardo, oh, was that Eduardo Oaks or? Um, no, or, no, that was not Eduardo. He's an interesting fellow, you know. It's like clearly very bright, but he lives in this uh, academic-like bubble that like he, he wants to understand everything from the atomic level up in order to use it. Yeah. So, you know, imagine I like. That mindset, personally. <laughs> you what? I identify with that mindset. So, I, so well, yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. If you wanted to use toilet paper, would you try to understand the atomic composition? Uh, <laughs> it's sort of. <laughs> I'm just saying it's a, he takes an extreme view, which maybe it, for him that's what he finds works. So, uh, but some interesting things come out of that, which is his EEV kind of stuff, which is very very explicit, right? Everything is laid out, so it's bulky in a sense, but it and. It, but he's got some good ideas on like tutorials and stuff. And he seems like he's more a scientist than a developer. So, you know, when we were trying to, I, I said, you could, the things you want to do, hyperbole has a toolkit for. So just use hyperbole and then we'll help you shape whatever you want to do. And that's where we were never able to do that because he'd say, well, okay. Uh, you you have a, a button type that does what I want it to do, but now explain to me all the activation process for that. And I'm like, well, then you'd have to understand the you know the key parts of the hyperbole code base, and you don't really need to to do what we're talking about. So we can't you know that would take a long time. So let's not do that. And that never worked for him. So he he decided to just build his own stuff. But then you look into that stuff and it's sort of what you described in your talk is, uh, you know, it's not structured, it's it's messy, it's it's just sort of, you know, cobbled together. Um, so well, personal, he, I would he, say, you know, it's it's yeah, but he's, more he, he's got the same he's got the same issue that it's he doesn't want to do it just for his personal need. He wants he wants this to be somebody that uh, something that people use. And so he gives talks and things like that. And he, so he, he's got this way of thinking that's very different than other people that keeps his stuff away from people, but that's not his intention. It's just, you know, sort of the operational mechanics of the way it is. And I'd love, you know, I'd love to help him with that or, or do something. He's a very nice fellow, but I, I haven't gotten him past the, you know, there are other abstraction levels besides the atomic level. Let's let's work on some of those levels. Yeah. Uh, for him, you know, there's some sort of barrier, I think, there. So well, you're saying parallel like that, too? You have to yeah, get I mean, your hands on everything? Yeah, and I think that's, 
and, and full disclosure, I, I don't, I didn't have a lot of time to, to write or to get in. I didn't have a lot of like in those 10 minutes to say everything I wanted to say. Um, like I'm not, I don't want to give the impression that I'm not a technical um, person. I am, I am a programmer and I've been, and like I said, I've been using Emacs for a very long time. Just okay. that over time, I probably, you know, just kind of have stayed in my personal sphere and kind of work, carved out a little thing that works for me. Um, so I, my perspective might be a little surprising um, to come up, you know, to, to people who might think, well, I talk like that, you're, you know, you're still a beginner or you're still um, on the fringes. I'm like, no, I don't think I'm, I'm neither, neither beginner, feel like I'm a beginner, nor am I on the fringes of anything. I've just, my path has taken me through a certain way that is, is personal. Um, it just happens, you know. Um, but I think what you're saying earlier is that to identify, uh, is, is that, that is one tension, the tension you were just mentioning of want to do something with the Amex is just one of those platforms where, where it's so can entice you to do things. It can be so interesting and enticing to do certain things that you, it can lead to a lot of pain and that you can, and confusion <laughs> where you can really want to learn something and think in your head. I'm always, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm always thinking of, I was a dialogue with, you know, a dozen people when I use Emacs, a dozen other people who, whose work I've read about and developers I've, I've read their works and stuff of, it's hard to be doing something and not be thinking about making it available for somebody else to use. I think it's, it's both very personal and it's also hard to have a personal barrier because I'm always, you know, I'm always thinking about how would I expose this functionality for general purpose use? How would I how would I publish this? Um, and so I can identify with that. I, I, and also, also I want you you want to know both. Maybe there's just certain personalities, and mine would be one of them, where you really want to know why things are happening the way that they're happening. And I think Emacs is one of those places where, when you come in, you come in on the ground floor, and you see, wow, I can go up so high, but also you you can look down and say, well, there's a hundred floors below me, and you get torn well, between like, the two, you know? I, I would ask a question like, do you uh, do you tend to look at the way list primitives are implemented in C, or do you just focus on the documentation of the list function and then work from there in terms of your Emacs, how far down you go? Good question. I, I would say it's changed recently. I'd say... Um, up until a couple of years ago, I was mostly focused on the on the inside, in, you know, inside the Lisp uh, okay. machine um, and going up. But I've started getting a little more curious about the C layer below that. Um, one of the things I started looking at was uh, some of the way that the key maps have been handled. The key, the the, the map lookups were handled mm -hmm. at the C level um, because of the uh, my Viper um, sort of affinity, my affinity for Viper. Um, because there's some some functionality there that changed or was um, made a little bit the implementation was made a little bit different. Um, so I guess I guess both, but I but I could understand that. Yeah, there's I, I I never felt like I had to understand anything below that level, um, but just it's good that. And it's do there. you go up? Do you spend a lot of time thinking about the user level and you user experience, user interfaces in your other work even? Or, you know, just to get an idea of the sort of problems you like to sink your teeth into, uh, you know, how you might provide some feedback on the hyperbole side, if you were to. I, I think I'm, I, 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 in terms of technical stuff, I do like to stay more, or I get more satisfaction, I think, thinking about the, the problem solving, um, especially in, in Emacs, um, just how to, how to build how to solve a, a problem in general. Um, just, you know, UI level stuff or user experience stuff, I think is just, it's it's harder. Um, it can be harder to do it right. Um, so I guess that's something that I don't, I just haven't, I guess I haven't put, I guess I put more of my energy towards the, the middle tier of things of kind of just building general solutions. But if, but if it comes, I mean, it, I, hyperbole is definitely high, if not on the top of my list now, coming out of today's, your presentation and, and hearing about it today, um, of things to look at no matter what. So, I mean, I'm, I'm eager to learn more about it and use it from, from wherever, wherever sure. I end up 
kind of landing on on that that spectrum. Um, well, I'm you know, wondering if you might have some time to. So we have there's two other people who gave the two other talks who work with me. We do a Sunday meeting, Sunday morning East Coast time. Uh, you know, one guy's on the development, and the other is uh, Ramin, who is a writer. And I mean, he's an ML engineer too, but uh, he's new to hyperbole. So he's kind of, you know, converting some of what he did in Word to hyperbole. And so he's kind of a good uh, feedback loop uh, for us there too. Uh, Matt and I have been, you know, deep in it for many years. So uh, we can't, we can't see it in an unbiased way. And I'm just thinking, you know, maybe if you have a bit of time, you may want to, you know, think about giving us some structured feedback or, you know, coming to one of those meetings, chatting Absolutely. with us. Um, yeah, you know, so, and I'm happy to answer your questions too, because I think, I, I just feel like there's, uh, I'll tell you, this is, so my background with Emacs, besides as a user, I built uh, something called InfoDoc, uh, which was an extensive IDE to try to bring out Emacs uh, functionality. Uh, many years ago, it was an extensive set of menus, pop-up menus, pull-down menus, and fixing a lot of stuff like, like in our mail, uh, the keys and the interface wasn't the same between the summary buffer and uh, the main buffer. And I, I normalized all that, fixed stuff in Dura. All of that was like all rolled into uh, InfoDoc so that a lot of these warts that people talk about that still are there to this day, some of them I, I see, uh, uh, got put together. And that was built atop uh, ZMAX, the the fork, XZMAX uh, okay. fork of, um, you know, when Jamie Zawinski was doing it. Um, and so, I, you know, I still use some of that with GNU Emacs, but I never took the time to repackage it and stuff like that. So that's sort of sitting out there. And then I built the OO browser, which was a small talk like a code browser for eight different object oriented languages. And that's sitting out there waiting for just, uh, I had it ready, largely ready, except for some documentation. And I, I have no time uh, to work on it. So it's never been, the modern version hasn't been republished for people to use. But you know, it sort of tells you some of the areas that that I've spent a lot of time in, and I've built some pretty big things. Um, so I've gotten to see you know what's absorbable and what's not, and you know there is a lot of people sort of staying down at that low level that I think you do tend to run into with Emacs users. But there was like people love people who use the OO browser. That was a very good user experience because it was just very smooth and it had multiple windows and you know did what people wanted and it was very fast because I focused on the algorithms um, and there was nothing else that could do what it could do. Now, now that we have uh, all these language server protocols, which I still think are not quite where they should be on the back end, but you know, I, it's nice that now they're integrating eClot. So I, I'm not a big user of those yet, but I hope to get more leverage out of them if they, in fact, you know, can give satisfy the queries that I really need in my work. So, yeah, yeah I, I think you'll find, you'll definitely find some utility. I think, you know, once you grok uh, a bit, and I don't think it'll take you that long to get enough a sense of hyperbole to start building a couple types, uh, button types yourself and uh, tailoring it to whatever your needs are. Uh, but I, as you said, I'm kind of interested in your thoughts about what will make that easier for people maybe with as, maybe with as, not as much technical knowledge as you have. Uh, and just, you know, that you're willing to put yourself in somebody else's shoes, I think is a very valuable uh kind of way to be and something I would, i'd like to I, well i certainly i'm willing to willing to try okay can't can't promise what my mindset will end up producing but i you know it's let's put it this way if i could if i could benefit from what you've created benefit from learning about it and at the same time potentially give some benefit back you know that seems like it's a win-win-win 
So I'm happy. Well, happy. I'll be very surprised if you can't. <laughs> and, but we we accept that kind of feedback too. Is that you know there's too much of a barrier to entry for this reason here. I love to hear those things too because you know there have been things that weren't there that we've built after. Like there's a guy Jean uh, Jean something. Uh, he's like a a business user who runs his business on this custom database that he's built. And he uses hyperbole as a front end to that back end database. He calls it, uh, I forget it's hyper or something. Uh, and he, he has a lot of deeper thoughts, you know, very specific, like he'll write in with just one issue that he's trying to do. And sometimes, you know, we'll implement things for him. And, and that seems to work pretty well. Sometimes he wants things, that are further afield, you know, and we don't go there, but he's, he's a useful, uh, one of the users on the very low traffic hyperbole mail list. So he's probably responsible for 80% of the, <laughs> the traffic, right? Now. Oh, he's the Pareto subscriber. Yeah. Yeah. Pareto, yeah. So, uh, but I'll, I'll look forward to it. And I, I think you'd like Grameen and, and Matt. Matt is uh, an engineer for Spotify. And he has implemented uh, 260 uh, test cases uh, for hyperbole that are run against the three major versions of Emacs every time we commit. Um, and that's proven to be very successful because, you know, sometimes we're modifying things at the engine level and who knows what, what set of button types uh, that affects. And yeah. uh, so, so it works really well when we're, and and we've had very good success that we have very few uh, you know bugs that we don't know about already uh, yeah. being found by users once we make a release. Neat. It seems like Plasma Strike want, is wants to jump in. I'm I'm sorry I, I didn't wasn't I did see your link earlier Plasma Strike about Emacs dashboard and I opened it, it looked pretty cool. Bob, you might you might. Yeah. Let's see. I've been getting my partner into. Logsec with uh, org, which is kind of like org Rome for knowledge uh, bases, and I've been using that, having my knowledge base on Logsec. He could look at it. He uh, it's getting synchronized with sync thing, and he can see how I do do the stuff. He can replicate it if he wants to. Then I'm thinking about putting CRDT with Emacs so that we could both edit the same document in real time. Mm -hmm. And that way I can get Emacs to work with the same data set as org Rome. And that way he doesn't have to learn absolutely everything that Emacs has to offer. So there's also, I can use all that stuff if I want to use it. Huh. Yeah, that's cool. I, I, you know, I've heard of that, but not necessarily didn't know anything about it um so that's I, i'm looking I, you know all i guess all i can say at this point is that it looks really cool and it's it, it does it sounds like you're saying it's friend it's easy to easy accessible easily to get into well you can also put it on your phone too so it oh. would probably be a really good way of doing that even though it's harder to get emacs on your phone <laughs> yeah, and on iPhones like as well. <laughs> you got to figure out. That's what people were asking about uh, touch screens. Have we yeah. thought about how to use touch screens? Uh, I think it's an interesting challenge for Emacs. You know, you even talk about mouse buttons, and people kind of freak out a lot of times because <laughs> they're so keyboard driven. Well, one of the great things about Emacs is it's a uh, keyboard is a first citizen and mouse can't be a first citizen because you're going to have to switch between it and all the time. Well, that if you go back to Engelbart's uh, work, it was one hand on the mouse, one hand on the keyboard. And, you know, we do miss some of that, that like the, that ability to point at things and uh, make operations on them. Now we have things like uh, Avi, I, I believe it is, right? For uh, where you can move around across windows and buffers very rapidly. So you can get to like an exact uh, point in a buffer much faster and then you could act on it 
you know, doing it that way. So, so it's kind of like a replacement for that, but, um, it's amazing when you start to think a little differently like that. And certainly people have done that with split keyboards and they, some people only use half of the keyboard then. So, and they have all the modifier keys, you know, that's what we're doing. In fact, hyperbole has a module that isn't active, but it's sitting out there and it turns, uh, the mouse keys into uh, two modifier uh, buttons. So it could be control and meta or whatever ha have you. And so if you want to operate that way, you can emulate what Engelbart was doing with your regular keyboard and the mouse. Didn't that uh, th didn't he have like a weird mouse where it had like more buttons on it or a uh, he was three buttons, uh, actually. Yeah, he had the chord keyboard you're thinking of. The keyboard was uh, like five five uh, keys that you could press as chords. So mm -hmm. you could press all five or three of them, and they would produce uh, different character outputs. Uh, I mean, they had a lot of things that we don't have. You know, their file system was node-based, and so everything uh, could be hyperlinked to and they had permanent IDs everywhere and they had journals and, and they had implemented almost all of this in assembly at first and it was on a time shared machine. So everything was collaborative instead of individual, but you know, so we'll, we'll get there eventually. <laughs> it's uh, a lot of, a lot of things have changed that we've had to, uh, you know, fight against separating people from collaborating that now everybody's trying to get back to and say, Let's build collaborative software. Yeah, I noticed that's another another one of those cycles that I noticed was the talk of uh, I forget who it was uh, the guy who did the SQLite thing and how he how he was basically saying, hey, text is great, but these these um, somewhat relational databases have a lot of things to offer. And I'm thinking, yeah, of course I, I agree, but it's just funny how so much of the Emacs ethos has been text can do so much and they were right and then now like this is it's like a turning point to say hey tech text can't do all these things but let's use emacs to take advantage of all this non-tech stuff too so it's just that's just one of those kind of those, those cyclical things of where we do what we can with text and then someone notices that hey we maybe we could do something without text and then that that balance might shift and just go back and forth and it sounds like it's the same like you're talking about with collaboration that have you ever seen uh, Visi Data? Uh, it's a uh, curses program that one guy has written that can manipulate any sort of tabular information. It's the it's the Emacs of uh, uh, like you don't want to use a spreadsheet and you want to do data analysis. Uh, it's pretty unbelievable what's in there. It's written in Python. Uh, but he has asynchronous slurping of super large CSVs that are compressed uh, and encrypted. And so it's basically like a Unix tool. You can use it command line wise, uh, but then it gives you a curses interface and you can slice and dice and get histograms. Um, so it's kind of amazing. I, I tried, the key bindings were so different. I did some work to try to make it more Emacs like uh, in that, but, it, he would have something that would be so valuable if it wasn't connected to the curses interface, you know, it was an API or, uh, and, but he likes it that way. And so he just keeps developing it. Uh, but it, it's really amazing if you have to process a lot of data and don't want to use Excel or something. Else uh, that's like with, that. a, with a Z, Vizi or S or? No, V-I-S-I, uh, D-A-T-A. -A. You'll, you'll find it. It's, uh, his name is uh, Paul uh, uh, Swan. It's not Swanson. It's something like that, though. I think Swanson. it is. I think it, according to his web, according to the website, it says Saul Swanson. So I'm guessing that. Yes, yeah, Saul Swanson. I get it backwards. I was say Paul yeah. Swanson. Yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah, I mean, I'm, that's another thing on my list. It'll go. Yeah, after. check it out. It, it'll blow your mind. What what's in there like yeah. that nobody and again it's like there's a small community but it's like all these people that it's such a simple download you know it's a standalone executable but uh largely uh 
you know, people just don't know about it. I tripped over it and I'm like, my God, how do you get this far without me hearing about it? I think I think that's one of those, maybe it's a case where the if you don't get a lot of attention, you end up doing things the way that you take things in the direction that, that you want to take them. And sometimes that leads to a bad place, and sometimes it leads to a really interesting and good place, and it's some, it's probably somewhere in between that. It seems like he's, he's taken this to well, a place. He had some usability issues, and then he got like two other people on the team, and they really helped him, I think, with that. you know, uh, He takes feedback pretty well, and the team takes feedback well. So they've been evolving it you know, from version one to like, I think they're on three now. And, uh, you know, it's come come a long way uh, that way, too. And now he's uh, got a job, I believe, where he can work on it as well. Uh, so, that's great. Uh, yeah, that's that's should advance it a lot, too. Uh, so, yeah, there's there's so much good stuff going on, you know, and it's just what's not going on is sort of what we had long ago was the reusability. Nobody's really building libraries anymore, you know, that people can build on. It's all like, well, we got to wrap a web app around our API and and that's it. And we're not going to make the code underlying the API shareable. You have to consume it, but that's all you can do. And and so I think we're everybody's rebuilding the same things again and again now because sort of what Stallman talks about. That yeah. sharing culture has been snuffed out uh, so broadly, you know, in terms of uh, what people spend their most of their waking hours on, right? As professional developers, and you know, you you kind of miss it, right? From when you could, because having written that OO browser, I mean, what I would do, what I remember doing, is saying, okay, here's a thousand classes. I'll just run my browser over it. And get to understand the interrelationships and it's like well where are those like you know they're out there there's still numerical libraries and things but you just yeah. don't have the, the ecosystem because the energy is going somewhere else you know to the finished uh products more than reusable building blocks i think yeah have you yeah. heard of glorious toolkit i think that's what it's called but it's a continuation wow, of small talk and it has yeah. a lot of concepts like that where you have multiple representations of the same data. Like the, also that um, mother of all demos where Engelbarton was doing that. Yeah, I, I've seen that many times. I, I got to work with Doug uh, maybe for a year or so. Um, before. Make sure I like, by the way, Plasma Strike. I'm going to put that on my, my queue to watch because I've never actually watched. I know about it. Oh, yeah. It, so thank it's you great. Much. It's great. It's nice to see him as a, a young man too. Like in the that was 1968. He started like 1957 or something. The stuff they had before 1960 is incredible. But there's yeah, also but, another spreadsheet like what you're talking about, but an Emacs and that talk right there too. But yeah, all this. I mean, it, just those initial tips. Uh, you know, I was finding stuff that I need so. I like that idea. I think uh, might do something with that if we can get a good database and link it into hyperbole uh, with some, you know, simple exposure that kind of gets people into some of this. Uh, but I'll tell you what. What I really want that I can't find. There's a, there's so much effort at low code environments now. I yeah. want a, a low code environment for spinning up web apps. Um, inside a company where it's not your focus it's just for an internal app right like we want to do say time tracking for one small team and we want to build it ourselves you know that's not the the real use case but if you took something like that so so you don't have a lot of resources you don't have a lot of time you know how to program but you want something that lets you operate like you're building a python command line thing but you want it to be a web app. Yeah. There's a cool project I saw for that that would be that was a peer to peer kiss web browser. Uh huh. Uh, well, that too. I mean, because I've looked at a lot of these, you know, there's uh, no code DB. Uh, 
the best one that I came to, but has been hard to set up internally, was uh, uh, it's like uh, from a German company. It's like designed in Germany and implemented in China uh, <laughs> a lot, or, or pieces of it. Um, and what is it called? Uh, I'll have to look at my, my database. Um, it's something, there's like something like Seaborn or uh, something like that. Uh, there's a couple projects that are named that way, but let's see. See, Seaborn low code. Uh, oh. C local environment. That's seaborn. See something. I'll find it, but the locals. So there's so much it's amazing to me. Uh, oh C table. That's it. C table. S E A table. That's kind of one we've been trying to get to work, but, uh, you know, there's still limits. So there's an environment where, like, if Emacs could let you do the mock-up of your web app using Lisp and then, you know, could be fully deployable onto a web stack, that would be – I mean, we have a web server. It's just a question of – and we have like C-based uh, fast web servers that you could interface to list. Uh, so I don't think like the capacity is the problem, but uh, you know, nobody's gone from providing the web server to here's how you could program, you know, the front end and connect it to the back end all in list. That's one of my, uh, my biggest issues is like, I, and you see it in the hyperbole work is I want simplicity and uniformity. I can't, I can't like program in three languages at the same time. So I can't use uh, JavaScript on the front end and Python on the back end and then have to deal with CSS as well. And HTML. Yeah. And HTML. It's like my mind just cracks up and I'm like, why do, and, and even if you were brought up that way, like, how can you be a 22-year-old and say, oh, this is so simple, <laughs> you know, because they do. They say that all the time. Well, this is a really simple thing to do. And, uh, I mean, yeah, if you're copying and pasting all your code, which is apparently what has become common now, right, is I'll, I'll just use this template, um, then, yeah, that's simple. But what about building it originally? It's like there's just so much for your mind to process and there was there was something called meta html which was really cool uh when html first came out and you're not going to be able to find this or even a reference to it probably but um this was two guys from mit and they said okay instead of uh programming at the html level let's write a lisp like um uh, interpreter that uses html syntax but will give you all the higher level programming constructs you need and so you could write stuff that looked like html but you'd be like processing lists of things and you know manipulating the dom in these uh very abstract ways and very little code and again you didn't have to mix a different syntax uh in like you have to now uh it was it was great and it wasn't a lot of code and it worked and nobody nobody cared nobody did anything with it it died on the vine and, well we didn't yeah. didn't need to uh endlessly measure every little mouse <laughs> movement and and right. eyeball engagement and then monetize it and analyze it so <laughs> you focus on just doing what you needed to do yeah well that's right friction right drives that's what I love. I, I'm stuck in a Microsoft environment now where there's a little bit of Linux here and there, but um, I'm a, either a Mac user, or, you know, I've always been a Unix user. So uh, Windows is like enormously painful despite 
the strides that they've made. And, you know, I always look at it and I say, well, it's a brilliant a business perspective because they know they create so many problems for people, so much friction that it creates enormous economic opportunities for many, many people. And that's what they do. They, they were, they, they have WSL. Do you know about that? Uh, oh, Windows. Windows. System for Linux, yeah. yeah. Um, so, and that they had a guy working on that who was leading it and they were just making stride after stride. And uh, apparently, you know, some high level executive probably did not like seeing this. And so he, they moved this guy off and now it's like a, a Microsoft, you know, so now all you see come out of there is like, we've improved windows terminal and the whole WSL thing moves at a snail space now. And you have to think that wasn't just like the guy got promoted, but that there was a strategic decision that this was uh, helping people too much to live in a non windows environment in their mind. And we we can't be supporting that. I think even it goes. Though, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, even though if you say I want to use Kubernetes or uh, you know in Azure, they say okay, use Linux VMs. So they'll do that all day long and tell you not to use Windows. Um, so there is still parts of the company that are like that and are open to it, but they they have it pretty well locked down. I think it goes in line with the attention economy where they want to control the computing experience and you want to use Microsoft apps, Microsoft Office. We don't want to make sure that you can reach out too easily into other ecosystems. Mm -hmm. Embrace, extend, extinguish, right? Is that the... Yep. That's it. An interesting Windows feature is you can update windows see that it's all the way up to date reboot it wait a day or wait a day and all of a sudden you have more updates for like a week or something oh, yeah. along those lines oh it's i don't know if any other operating system that does that you Anything only have two minutes until your reboot is done and then it's like it comes back now it's an hour and then another <laughs> half an hour Right, <laughs> they only give you little snippets. Is Plasma Strike, by the way, is that stack that you're describing with uh, LogSec and and syncing and everything? Is that something that you've published any any examples? I saw, saw you said something in the IRC, but I just lost track of what was going on in IRC. So I'm sorry if I missed that. Uh, no, I haven't. This is all the. Now I'm thinking about just putting a whole bunch of res uh, some resources together. Of uh, Hyperbol does a really good job of showing you a knowledge base plus enough configuration to use it. EEV does a really good job of showing you enough config uh, in source documentation to play it out and see how it actually works in practice. Hmm. Or Chrome needs something like that. So I don't know if I'll but you need like some minimal config to work with that. So you can look at the more philosophy plus uh, packages combination. How do you guys like the hyperborg term? If we, if we use that, does that strike you as a little? A little is that, is that what you were going for? Were you trying to conjure up the Borg? A Borg well, like yeah, well, uh, Sasha came up with hyper org for hyperbole and org. And then I thought, well, it'd be funnier if we called it hyperborg. And, uh, you know, because it it's kind of is like uh, Stallman talks about org wants to take you into this environment. And, uh, you know, hyperbole certainly does too. So if we put the two together, we would definitely have something like the Borg. My impression, and I, I said something to Keelero, I don't know if, I, if I, I spoke wrong, but my impression was that it was not, this was not something that was going to be created. This was just a way, just like a... Oh, right. It's just, a, yeah, an amusing kind of term. But but I'm, I do want to do more work. I've joined the org mail list, and 
I mean, just I did a lot of work for that presentation and that sort of struck me. And I said, you know, uh, we just there's a certain level of work we need to do. Years ago, we were thinking we'd put hyperbole into Emacs. Now that org is, uh, you know, there's no reason not to. And were it to be there, you know, there are things that there's namings that we would correct and and the interface points to org, we would want to do something about and work out with them, especially the made a return key. Uh, that's the main, if we could resolve that between the two packages better. And we've done a pretty good job just on hyperbole Zen, but we've never talked to the org people about it. So it kind of seems like the term would work better the opposite way because org wants to go around and doesn't have that modularity that your package has. Mm -hmm. So you're suggesting like let them give the key over to us and then we'll support some of their. Well, it's more of meaning the board taking over everything because org mode comes and they take over like they're all their code works with org mode, not K outline or markdown mode or anything right. along those lines uh, yeah more so the board part comes more from the hyperbole side yeah. oh but maybe it, it's fitting in the long run because no matter perhaps if you provide a or if hyperbole provides a very convenient enhancement on top of how people used to use org mode it'll just become part of org mode eventually yeah it be hyperbole. that's something i can see too is that they just become one big thing that Stallman doesn't like. Because <laughs> we do have a bit of that in all of them. I mean, I totally get what he's saying and I, I buy it. You know, I'm kind of like a functional programmer and I like bottom up uh, development. But, you know, like people ask us all the time okay, if you have four or five things in hyperbole, why don't you separate them into separate packages? And it was the same thing for Engelbar. Well, one, it would be a lot more overhead just in separate manuals and, you know, dealing with separate communities. We want everyone who uses it to have the same baseline experience. And so even though, yes, you could separate out the button functionality from the K outliner and the Rolodex, and the Rolodex originally was a separate uh, thing by itself. Uh, we find putting them all together gives people the same thing that Emacs provides. It's sort of you don't have to use all of the libraries, but having them there ensures you that when somebody references it, it it works. And you have a lot fewer of those kinds of, well, I only have the subsystem. So when I invoke your code, it breaks. Yeah, I think and I think I mean, I don't think there's any I, I don't personally have like a preference as to what the right direction is. I just I acknowledge that the, the downsides and upsides of each choice. But one thing I have noticed is I think something, I think it was McGit. That's how, that's how I say it. Um, but you know, eventually, initially it was one thing, and now I think it's turned into a, um, a dozen or maybe even a couple dozen different packages. Um, and I remember I went to update it once, and I had to you know navigate a few different like. Um, uh, what's the word combinatorial you know I had to go two or three levels of dependencies deep in each level right. and introduce right. two dish uh, yeah um, so yeah that 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 can happen is, where, is you, there's a situation where you can see those downsides where the more you know splitting things apart is can, can we're some, we're some fighting with that at work right now is like do we create more repos so we can deliver microservices or, you know, how do we split things out on the containers? And it's very, very complicated. And even, you know, with years, we've got years of experience with our architects and we're all like going back and forth on how far to go because one of, one of the people is very worried that we get into that dependency hell kind of thing with some of our new get packages. Uh, so, yeah, I wish there were easier solutions. And I that's, again, for hyperbole, there's, you know, there's none of it. There's no external dependencies. It's just what version of Emacs you're using. And people don't realize that. Um, you know, they say, oh, it's so big, like, like it's dependent on all this other stuff. But it's not. It's just, you know, if 
if it need, I mean, it, it will leverage stuff again, that's in core Emacs, but it won't require you to load a third party package just because, you know, it's useful or interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think Emacs does a really good job on this because unlike the normal GUI apps, if I want to change my theme in Emacs, I get to change everything to a dark theme or white theme or whatever. And unlike, and you can't really do that very in any way that shares any of the code or the settings with all your GUI applications, but also with a terminal, you, you miss out on a whole bunch more stuff because, well, you have, I, I see you do, don't get GUIs or unless you're talking about two uh, TUI apps, but they're not really CLI apps because they're like a half uh, step uh, stepchild. They don't get near as good themes because they can't integrate into all the packages near as well. No mouse and all the various other things like that. Where are you guys located? I'm in I'm in Virginia. Oh, I just had guests from West Virginia. Uh, I'm in Connecticut. Oh. Utah. Oh wow. Well, Utah. So we're nice. we're almost spanning the entire continent. Almost. <laughs> if we round up, we can consider it to be to be the case. I work I work with a lot of people in India, so we've got like a twelve hour difference much of the year, and that's. That's fascinating to try to work through <laughs> all the time. But uh, on hyperbole, we have one guy in Sweden and one guy in Japan. So we're all over the map too. Yeah, yeah I, I, I've been, I was involved with a little hobby group for something unrelated. And we were in various countries and it was always, well, the, the, the best thing that we could do was just find the time at which all, like, all of us would be the least miserable and the least tired and, and not, you know, there was no good time for a, a meeting. There was just the least bad time. Well, I, I, I was struggling to finish up uh, my presentation. It just, you know, I would like want to show an example and then I'm like, well, I need to change the code a little bit. So I'd go and, you know, I'd add capability and hyperbole and, and it was just a lot more work than I expected. So November 4th was the deadline to send in your video that came and went and then I couldn't touch anything until the weekend and I get maybe half a day with the holidays and stuff. So comes to be last night, still haven't uh, sent the video in. You know, I had told them though a week ago that I'll do it live if I, I can't get the video in. But I'm like, you know, it'd be nice to have it recorded and they do all this stuff to it. So I finished the video at 5.30 in the morning and i just you know no i i was dead so uh i just uploaded it and i figure you know i had tested snippets before of how i recorded so i sent it to him i go to bed i get up and i have a message waiting uh the video cuts off at 18 minutes and it was 36 minutes long and i'm like oh come on it must be the software like just can't handle a file that size and it's stupid but i play it back on my system and it plays perfectly fine and they gave me the checksum of the file the size of the file those matched up so we knew we had uploaded a good thing so i just went back to them and said no nope, it works here and and then they went and researched and found you know it was their software and they they were able to make it work so i, I was good but you, you know that's <laughs> like right at the edge. <laughs> it's like five thirty this morning. Yeah. And yeah. you haven't have you and you and then you got some sleep after that. Is that what you? Yeah, I, okay. I got up at like nine thirty, so I'm running on a little, not too much sleep. But uh, no, I was very happy because I got to. I actually like Raman who did his, and he sort of had his face uh, behind an Emacs window transparency through the Emacs window, the, like you know, he spent, he spent like at least 20 hours, like just on the video part or something. I, I literally did one recording. I mean, I had done samples a little bit, but I sat down, I said, I'm just going to try to run through it, the whole thing. No breaks. I, I did both my face, 
you know, they were separating their face video from their audio for some reason. And they did all these separate tracks, one recording and uh, threw it over the wall. So it was pretty good. Actually, considering. And it, yeah. And it's, I think it's, it's easier to do with a longer video. Um, because I, I was in much the same situation, and if any organizers are reviewing this recording, um, you know, I, 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 I was a day ahead of you, Bob. Um, oh, really? <laughs> I, I, I submitted it a day before you, and I went to sleep, I think, roughly 24 hours before you did. Um, but, you know, it's, it's – so I, under, I, I was scrambling to do a lot of those things, too. But, you know, because of my own fault, and again, if any organizers are listening, I – Sincerely apologize and thank you and uh, admire your um, saintly level of, of tolerance and patience there. And uh, I hope that you, I hope that they spend a lot of time and energy um, just hitting things with baseball bats after this conference. Because I think that, I think that they've probably suppressed a lot of, uh, a lot of negative energy from, from having to, to process things like that. They're, they're incredible. They, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I said thank you like at the like an hour into the conference because it was so I was looking at all the detail they had. And, you know, you see the way it's grown from year to year that you could just tell there was a tremendous amount of effort put in to have all these different formats and dealing with it. people have disabilities. And, you know, I mean, they're just very thoughtful all around and a great set of people. So I think we're better too. Every year they get better at it. Yeah. Yeah. They're clearly, I like, they took a DevOps kind of approach to it, which you can also see, I guess they have some people they're using Ansible uh, to maintain some of their environments. So it's like, wow, that's, that's pretty advanced way to do it. And it shows. Yeah, I think there's so they a pretty still struggled in parts, you know, it's like, like this, they had trouble, you know, I, I was asking multiple times, it's like, is, is the video going to be playable? And there'd like be no answer. And then it's like, okay, don't worry, we're, we're taking care of it. But they couldn't say because they hadn't converted it the way they wanted to yet. And then they finally got there and they like 20 minutes before the presentation is when I guess I got on with you, right? Uh, plasma strike and um, we we did the prep the before prep so it was it was it was a good good experience but I, I have to know yeah I thought I would have it done no problem November 4th so I think that and I did get very busy at work but um, you know that tells you something just about and I'm not I don't do video as much so that was part of the problem yeah um, it, it's yeah I mean, I'd say the, the the most concrete lesson that I learned, maybe not even a lesson so much as a as a punishment, is that if I dare to submit anything next year, I I'll I'll make sure that I'm done recording it before I even propose it, because I I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't want to have them have wonder, like, okay, is he going to wait until the very quick, the last day? Like, I'm going to. You're on that list. <laughs> I'm sure I am. So I will. I will have it done in the summer of 2023, and I will include it. I will upload it before I even submit it to them. Uh, Did you not get it. that message? Sasha was so nice about it. She's like, you know, it's really not a problem if you uh, don't have time. You know, we can just cancel. And I'm like, I've never canceled on a talk uh, before, so I'm going to get it done, even if I have to do it live. Yeah. You know, I should, oh. yeah, I got, I got similar ones. Go ahead, go ahead, Plaza. How would that, how would that work if you didn't know exactly how much time that you'd have for the talk if you're going to do it all in advance? Oh, oh, before you propose it, yeah. Well, you can take a <laughs> shot at it. <Yeah. laughs> They'll give you a slot. You say I have a 20 minute video ready to go. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Or I mean, and plus, I think it's also it would be. It doesn't necessarily indicate that it's the final product, but it could be the final product. You could say, okay, here's here's 10 minutes or 15 minutes, and I will try to iterate on this. But if I if I default on this loan, so to speak, it's it serves as collateral. Maybe it's not not necessarily the final product, but if it needs to be the final product, they could use it that way. Um, I think the thing that they're most worried about was just having to having to process things at the last minute and having to run it live if necessary 
Um, so I don't think they, they, you know, care that much about um, changing, you know, changing the length or so. Well, maybe they would. I don't know. But I guess that that would mess up the schedule. Well, the the subtitles were really popular. I understand. So that's that's a big thing that would have been nice uh, to yeah. have, which I imagine. I imagine yeah, they're going to process that. Yeah, yeah. I, I hopefully I can I can help them with with subtitling some of the things that that didn't have them yet. Um, there, because yeah, there's still a lot of work that I think needs to be done even after after the fact. Or, and, um, you know, with with transcribing these sessions, even not all of them, but at least some of the, the questions and answers and things. Plasma Strike, did you? Did I hear? Did I understand you say that you you were a, a volunteer for managing the this year? Or? No, I just oh, okay. I was just asking a question. Oh, I got you. No, I thought I heard. I might have misheard something you said earlier. Are, are you Corbin? Me? Yeah. No. 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 Okay. I thought you sounded like Corbin. You know him? I can, maybe a little bit. I can hear it a little bit. <laughs> Okay, but you use Plasma Strike. You were saying that you um, you do use a lot of theming and things like that in terms of like your like various applications, like color themes and things. I've used various. I've uh, Solarize, Doom themes. So I think there's a Tron theme that I use, but now I'm just using the Modus themes. Just yeah. simple black and white. That's done really well. Yeah. Yeah, simplicity. That was actually going to be one of the things that I, I wanted to mention in my talk, but again, those ten minutes were turned out to be brutal. Um, I wanted to mention <laughs> how how people like like us, and when I say us, I just mean I don't mean any necessarily you two, just people that I was speaking for, um, are maybe a little bit scared of themes. You know, like I, I was going to mention that we like I try to stay the heck away from fonts and colors and things because I just. Mm -hmm. It's it. I don't know if I have the bandwidth to to keep them. I kind of just declare advanced bankruptcy on those and say, you know what, whatever it looks like, I'm gonna live with it. <laughs> I just so. look at like twenty themes, pick one that suits my taste, and then live with that. So I found one called Cream Soddy, like cream soda, but S O D Y, and uh, that's what I use as a dark theme, and I, yeah. I find it you know very appealing in general so but yeah i was noticing like the org people have so much uh tweaking you know, visuals you know it was kind of amazing some people's uh presentations and i i'm really not into that uh but i do have a feature in uh hyperbole which is kind of cool um so there's this uh subsystem called high control which lets you control your windows and your frames interactively. So it's it's kind of like you go into a mode and it stays live until you quit. And so you can use regular insertion keys to manipulate things. One of the things it has in conjunction with a, a package called uh, Zoom Frame is uh, you can change your default uh, face across like all your frames with one key, grow it, shrink it, and I found that, and not just the default face, but all the related faces, so that everything stays a consistent size. Every time I would try any of the built-in things, I would always end up changing a face or, or multiple, and something else would stay tiny. And it just annoyed the hell out of me. So I implemented this was, that. This was in high control or Zoom? Doc. Yeah, it's yeah. in high control, the Z keys. Um, you use, uh, uh, I guess, capital Z for make it bigger and lowercase z to make it smaller. So you're zooming both ways. And the neat thing is that uh, what high control has is a persistent prefix argument. So say like you want to move a window, uh, say you want to move a frame two pixels at a time. So you set the prefix argument to two, and then every time you hit your arrow key or whatever moves it, it moves by two pixels. You can change that to 20 and it'll move by 20 pixels. And uh, the 20 will apply to every successive operation until you change it. And to change it, you just hit a decimal point. So you can say period one zero and then you get a 10. Um, or uh, you know, just set it to zero and then it's it's off. 
Uh, and so it's very rapid. So you're doing these single keys and PDF uh, dot one zero, you know, and and so you can string these together in your key series too, and you get this incredible operation. It it can place uh, frames at any of the corners or the center, top center of the screen too. And on a Mac, it will account for the toolbar uh, and only grow so it doesn't overlap that. And, you know, all these kind of fit and finish things are just like pre-programmed in there. So when you're actually doing it, you're so, you know, I mean, don't you hate that? It's like you expand your window programmatically and then half of it's off screen, right? Yeah. Uh, for no reason at all. And then you got to go manipulate it. So, you know, I, I don't know. There was one time when I decided to do this and I just thought of those pain points and, you know, I took care of them all in there. So that's kind of a useful thing uh, that, uh, and one guy, uh, his fingers, uh, if you saw the presentation, uh, he, he was losing, you know, carpal tunnel like problems, but very severely. So he went to voice control and he was using Emacs and he discovered high control. And he said that was like a life changer because he always wanted to manipulate his windows, his frames. And now he didn't have a good way because he couldn't hit all these keystrokes. And now he can just say those key sequences and it does it all for him very rapidly. Oh. Another guy years ago I was working with, there's this brilliant guy named, uh, oh God, this is, what is his name? works for Google now and uh, it's an Indian name. I forget his name, but he's been uh, blind since birth and he got a PhD in computer science and he's worked before Google. He worked at like Sun and, you know, just all the major companies. And I guess a lot of his work is on uh, making uh, technology accessible to the blind or disabled. So he wrote a package called uh, Emacs, Emacs Speak. Speak. Yeah, Raman. Raman is his name. And T T V Raman. And uh, so Emacs Speak is another whole environment, right? That uh, lets uh, a blind person uh, utilize Emacs as an advanced screen reader instead of reading you the whole screen. It, it knows what your context is. And it just reads your appropriate stuff. So like he can understand code very rapidly. Additionally, he can change the speed of the voice so he can listen to something at five times speed and absorb it. So he can actually get a picture of code and manipulate it. So he uh, and I got together years ago and he integrated it with hyperbole. And he was using hyperbole, you know, to give him macro kind of capability in a lot of stuff. So. I thought that was very cool. And he uh, he was just uh, a very cool guy uh, out in Silicon Valley. So glad to see he's done so well all this time. Because he's, got, an, no he's, he's got an example config in his uh, package. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it has your package configured inside of it or. I don't know. Like I have it. It's got some uh, but... for using CSS. I think it, it, he was talking. Something I read is oh. it would change how it the tones and voices that the voice was using. Right. The funny thing is that he, you know, he he's so devoted to his uh, seeing eye dogs, right? He's had to have a number of them through his life. Uh, so he he writes these fake press releases every time he releases a version, and they're all named after the dog. And it, the dog is making the announcement. You know, it's like so and so is proud to announce Emacs speak what a the the friendliest dog release in history. <laughs> so they're kind of fun to read. I've seen his uh, his messages on the mailing lists. Rather, I've mm -hmm. seen his subject lines on the mailing list because I usually don't have I don't give myself the time to read a lot of those right. messages. So, but now I'm gonna right. now that I have that context, I'll I'll dig into his messages and see because it sounds very interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, it would be. And if you're like my son has no problem seeing, uh, but he has a bit of trouble processing 
um, words when he's reading. Um, so he uses Audible while he reads, and it's too slow for him. So he uses Audible at like twice the speed and finds that that really helps him understand passages. So it may have utility for uh, people without visual disabilities too. That's a good point. Yeah. That's uh, probably so much there that that doesn't really get thought about because I just think this is what how we have to do. It's in front of you. Consume it. Consume it the same way well, everybody else consumes it. And if you have trouble, then it's on you. Well, here's a, an interesting usability tidbit. R Raman, uh, a different Raman, the Raman who works on hyperbole, was showing me his presentation. And uh, he had the text of the presentation there. And every time he would say something, the, the word uh, that he was saying would be highlighted on the screen. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's very impressive. And it followed his, uh, his speaking perfectly. I'm like, how did you do that? And he said, oh, oh I'm just highlighting each word manually. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, wow now that it's it's like being a drummer you know he had such perfect cadence that yeah. i couldn't tell that this wasn't automated uh that he did it so beautifully while he was speaking it or or watching himself speak played back uh so <laughs> it would have been nice if it was an automated thing but apparently it takes a human to do I, I had to rig something up when I was recording my video because I I wrote I did it I scripted it all um, uh -huh. and I I just couldn't I wasn't I didn't have the mental bandwidth to try to memorize it at that point so I uh -huh. just split everything up into into half paragraphs basically and tried to get it up as close to my camera as I could um, oh, yeah. and I had to scroll my mouse wheel every time I came to the end of a paragraph I had to scroll the script with one hand. And my other hand was controlling the slot, the so-called slideshow, which was just paging through my org, my org outline. Um, and I, I think about five to ten times I had to stop recording it because so I I scrolled, I got off sync with with my, either my script or my outline or both, and just you know with ten minutes, like oh I can't go back and I lost, I lost like five percent of my time. I have to start over. So I, can, I, I can't imagine doing it on a word by word basis. It's strange we're still recording this, but we're getting into just the, you know, interesting story. Oh, it's a last thing. So, you know, this is just kind of like, I feel like this is the the after party. Right. Maybe or they'll the cut party. it off. So I, I work with a British guy, brilliant uh, mathematician kind of guy. He's a financial guy. And uh, he, he has that, you know, often British kind of capability. He, he speaks beautifully, but... He can speak off the cuff about anything he's working on, just like he has spent a week uh, working on it. So he gets called on like, you know, the bigger bosses will say, we got to show this, do this demo for this client, literally like five minutes ahead of time. And he'll just go into it and there won't be an um, there won't be a pause. It'll just be this fluid sort of thing. And I'm like... Man, if you could bottle that, uh, you know, because do what you're saying, doing uh, you're on camera, doing a video thing, speaking, managing your thoughts, you know, keeping your context. It's uh, super hard, I think. And uh, when you see somebody who has that, like Steve Jobs, you know, he would practice, I guess, but he had that ability that he yeah. could communicate anything uh, beautifully. That's an art. Or maybe not. Maybe it's just a, it's a personality trait. It's uh, yeah. I don't. I don't think you can train. You can definitely improve, but I don't think you can train people if you're not born with that kind of silver tongue. <laughs> yeah. Right. And maybe it has to do with not being conscious of things. I think a lot of times it has. It's you've never really thought about what about what happens if you mess up or something. It just hasn't. Right. You know, you're, you're blessed to not be able to worry about certain things. Yeah, that's true. That's why you see all the technical people. <laughs> that struggle, right? Is uh, but he's you know he has that too. He'll be very self-critical at times and stuff. But I think when 
you know, like all of us. I mean, if I start out, I, I may be thinking about a bunch of things, but once I'm into it, you can see, you know, you sort of relax and you're just focused on that and all those other things kind of fade away, right? You can get into that zone. It's there for all of us. Well, as you become competent in things, the technology more and more disappears because I don't, as Emacs users, we don't think about what keyboards we are touch typing is generally at another level because we split the windows without ever thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Muscle memory. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. It's like use that for like the value add and then, you know, literally have your muscles almost take care of the the stuff that's silly like you know opening a directory when it's part of a path colon separated set of things i don't want to think about that i just want to point and go and i don't want to know what the key binding is or any of that kind of stuff so um that we're definitely trying to like push it down to your unconscious and then see how far we can take that you know like what how can you fly uh I, you know, people sometimes have said there's some magic or that's why I mentioned that term today, but I think that's an important concept. You know, if it, if it seems like magic, then you probably got it down to the right level <laughs> that people don't have to think about it anymore. And they're just, it's in their subconscious and they can move on to more interesting things, which is sort of why we build software in the first place, I think, right? to automate the mundane and let us keep adding value at another level yeah although it's very hard to remember that sometimes <laughs> right very hard to when remember. you're when you're say, saying oh move this pixel over here right <laughs> yeah like you were saying about front end uh, development and how hard it can be sometimes the all the business people want to put their two cents in it has to be it has to be making somebody money at some point yeah it's helpful helpful when it does but <laughs> you know not only you can build you can spend a lot of money on things and they i mean look at uh look at what's happening to the tech companies now after billions of dollars invested and they're just throwing away thousands of people and all their knowledge bases and yeah yeah uh, it's, it's competitive. I mean, you know, it's like we don't need a thousand task management commercial tools, right? Project management tools. So the market will shake out. There'll be three big ones maybe. And then everybody else is, if they exist, they're losing money. So, but, you know, so are you going to be one of those three? Mm. That's, that's the problem is that there's not enough room left for a lot of the things that people are trying to do. And you talk about advancing things and it's like stuff like hyperbole or this mother of all demos. It's like sometimes we don't always have to move forward because you, all this mother of all demos is in a lot of ways way ahead of anything we have now. And it seems like it's ahead of hyperbole in a lot of ways. And Well, I've talked to a lot of non-technical people and they always say, you know, the problem I have is technology moves so fast. I can't keep up. And I say, well, actually, in thinking about it over decades now that I've aged, uh, I see it as cycles much more, right? And like a sine wave that, uh, first of all, we, we do lose knowledge. We don't have a good way of capturing it. And I mean, I literally knew something about Engelbart's work and it was over a decade later that I rediscovered it and, and then got in touch and interacted with him. So, so we're definitely like forgetting about the past and get a new generation in. They don't know the lessons, they screw things up. And eventually we rediscover that somebody already solved this and we can go and use it again. And then we start building on that. And then a war happens and it gets destroyed. And then we come. So, so you actually get a lot of time, right? Like ethernet, right? To the masses from when it was invented to when it got deployed, uh, you know, hypertext. So let's say if Engelbart was showing it in 1968 and before that, Ted Nelson was opining about it a ton. Uh, 
So 1991 or two is when we got the web. So 25 years at least. And I think that's sort of cycles. I don't think there's a lot of technology cycles that are less than 10 years. Uh, but you often see the 10 to 15 to 20 year cycles from research to, you know, broad consumer adoption. Uh, you've got about that amount of time to deal with it. So if you can have a research team that stays 10 years ahead of mm -hmm. like what's out in the marketplace, you have lots of time to develop your product. It's not this, it's got to be out yesterday. You only have two months or the market's going to close up. But it's very difficult to convince business people of that because there's so much chatter on the business side and people will show their their mock-ups and their demos very broadly. And then they're like, they've got it, you know? It's like, what have they got? Well, the, I saw it, I saw it, yeah. And what's behind that thing that you saw? You know, they just whipped it up right over a weekend and there's nothing, there's no database, there's no, uh, there's no user validation. So you kind of have to contend with that, which is probably why a lot of Emacs users are in academia and they don't want to deal with those issues. Yeah. It's kind yeah, of you like can also that. advance by doing the uh, doubling down on the stuff that works. Like, for instance, uh, cars, like, oh, look, the car's better. It's got a higher Bluetooth version. See, it's better. <laughs> but what about the gas mileage? How long does the motor last? But it's got a higher Bluetooth version. See, it's, it's more technology. That's, and then, then the job is to create the need and the desire for that higher Bluetooth version, right? Yeah, to get, to make. Well, haven't out. haven't you bought like the same brand of car, even the same model, like a couple years later, and you're like, "What did I just buy? I really yeah. loved the one from five years before." My my first job out of school was at Motorola, which had a great engineering culture, but uh, uh, there came a time when uh, they they brought in automotive designers to shape uh, the shape, the physical shape of the products. And oh. we had some very sexy, beautiful looking things. Then those guys left the company and they hired a bunch of people pretty much out of college, you know, who had studied the field. And all of a sudden we had like these blocky kinds of things that like nobody would want to hold in their hand. And uh <laughs> And I'm like, what? wait, what just happened? Didn't they document any of their work or anything? But that's, you know, we really do need the knowledge base inside people's head because we're nowhere near documenting it well enough. Uh, the design principles that people use, you know, you look at, you can see it in Apple a little bit too, right? Since Johnny Ive left. It's like, yeah, where's where's the next design language? I just got an update to my iPhone and I noticed they changed some of the icons, but they just made like the time on my home screen like three times as thick, the, the font width. You know, it's uh. like ultra bold. And I'm like, yeah, that it doesn't really look right. It just looks like it's in my face. And yeah. I'm like, well, somebody, you know, got that through whatever they're running there now. But I would have tossed that on the, you know, <laughs> the bad idea pile, I think. Oh, huh. so, that seems like kind of an, an obnoxious change to make for something that is so supposed to be. It's, it's when you want it, you really want it. And when you don't want it, it's supposed to be unobtrusive. I don't know. Wait. Yeah. Oh. See how yeah. big that is? <laughs> I wonder if that yeah, uses more power since it's if it's white it's gonna be <laughs> using all your all your uh, pixels there. Oh yeah. So I, I guess we have time in the end. I mean that like you know we all have these crazy deadlines, but in the end to actually move the needle forward, it's going to take a while, and there's going to be certain steps backwards. And I think Emacs is sort of our shared community knowledge base right as long as we have these libraries even if they get a little out of date we can update them to the next generation when we're ready and that's something that a lot of people don't have right they're just going from application to applications and they're losing all the core capabilities 
every time they transition. Well, I think that's the, like when I was talking about the themes and the modularity and just using all that stuff is if you can use all that stuff and especially if you can use all, a whole bunch of really old code, that's, that's the tricky question of how do you use as many things as you, as possible at once without everything clobbering each other? Yeah. Well, here's, or a, just here's breaking. a new thing. I learned this lesson. Don't, don't add a date created entry to your uh, code files if you don't also include a last modified date because we had uh, 1991 entries in hyperbole files and people would download it and they look and they're like this thing is ancient i'm not going to use this because we had pulled out the modified because uh you need certain code to update the modified automatically when you save it and you know not every developer would necessarily have that so but when that started happening i said we're putting this back because <laughs> they didn't want to get rid of the create date and lose that that you sort of know how far back it goes yeah yeah i've i've always gotten a little i always find it interesting when i see working with something and i and i realize that it hasn't been touched for or it appears not to have been touched for a couple decades and i think oh my gosh either I, I, if i found a problem i'm thinking oh i, I this can't be right. I, I must be missing something here because there's no way that this problem could have existed for 20 years and no one ever noticed it or ever cared about it. And sometimes I'm wrong. Sometimes I, it's not a problem. Well, you have this quote for Emacs. It's like Emacs is, you, you want editors like you want wine. Uh, I think it's wine. It's like a fi the older it is, the better it gets because you get th that composite of all these philosophies, workflows, uh, workflows and forming packages and uh, if you're going to be on the cutting edge 95% of the ideas will probably not be good 5% of the ideas will be good but versus looking at the older stuff where a lot more of the ideas will be good and yeah. you'll get all well, like merger packages like you were talking about how you have all the window control with the Mac stuff. You just get the stuff uh, streamlined. And maybe like, you know, if we look at Richard Stallman's uh, Emacs environment and maybe yours, John, you like to keep it simple, like you said, not theming it because you've gotten, you know, to a steady state that works well for you. I, I visited Xerox Park years ago and when I went around looking at all the workstations, they were all using like 10 year old window managers, just like the oldest look and feel. Nobody was touching anything, right? Because they were creating the future, they thought, and they really didn't care about uh, keeping up to date on on their packages. They, they had to write their own stuff. So I thought that was kind of fascinating to learn that a lot of, you know, high level thinkers don't necessarily treat their tooling environments the same way. At least not, not every day. They probably yeah. say finish whatever they're doing or, you know, reach the right. milestone. Every Maybe five they're... years or something. I, I, that's what I, I'm sticking with this one Subaru car and I've had a bunch of other things, but this one has an engine that they don't make anymore, a V6. Now they're sort of like turboizing things to get the equivalent power and it, it doesn't perform the same way. So I'm like, well, I got to wait till the bottom of this car rusts out yeah. um, before I replace it because I, I like so much about it, even though I'm missing some of the new technology. I just don't want to change it out. Yeah. One of the things I like a lot about how Emacs looks is it looks to me really nice in a no bullshit ultra functional <laughs> way where it's like i i like that it doesn't do the smooth scrolling that it scrolls line by line by line even though that's not as modern and hip because it's more down or down to earth functional 
I don't know, in like a more engineering or something that's just not as flashy, normal way. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I, and it affects, it really affects how it feels. Like you're, in, somewhere in your brain, you're some kind of object that your brain thinks that you're dealing with, even if it's not really an object, you know, part right. of your brain just is, has to relate to the world that way. And I think that's just one of those things is that if you can, if your brain can actually feel like you're, you can almost feel each line like passing past, you're going past your scrolling action. Um, your brain, it, like you, you keep, helps keep you oriented. Like you can, almost, it's like, a it's your visual or experience creates a tactile experience for you. I, I think that's awesome. one of the the VR problems that the, the industry is suffering from is that it's so easy to program things that will entirely screw up somebody's, uh, uh, what do you call the subconscious uh, parts of our, our nerve nervous systems. So, right. I mean, they can scare the hell out of people. They can make them sense something that's not there. And, and it's like, you know, it just, we're, we're not ready for that in so many ways and it's just too easy. And so if you can't depend that like physics will keep you from like flying off the earth, uh, you, you know, anything can happen. It, I don't know how many people will want to really, you know, experience that for any continual amount of time. The other you know, thing you, you don't get is like you don't have to worry about how much time it does to scroll. So it's going to be a lot more performant, faster. I love turn as a counter example. I love turning off the animations on my phone because it makes it snappier, faster, and I don't want to just insert animations on my phone just to slow it down. And you you open up your contacts. It's like I want to make I turn the DPI on my Android phone down, yeah, down. So that I can see more contacts at once, so I don't have to scroll as many times. And yeah. I, I want I make the home screen have more icons on it because I'm accurate with my thumbs. So I want to see as many icons as I can, so I don't, so I can much faster see and uh, click the right one I want to. I scroll less pages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you probably have a hard time making it do what you want, I'm guessing, too, because that's just the one area where, or phones especially, it's just one, one area where it, you are not respected. You know, like you're, you're, you're going to take whatever experience they figured was the right one that week and force you to eat it, you know, like a, like a, a head of cattle. You know, you're, you're eating that experience like it's feed, and it'll change whenever you want, whenever they want, and it's going to, I don't know if you, if you feel the same way, but. I, my first phone was a Windows mobile phone that the person was selling because they wanted an Android phone. Oh. And I've always been on custom ROMs, although lately I've been getting annoyed about it because they've been losing all the, uh, let's see, remember reading this blog post about somebody liking custom ROMs and they're saying that Android was becoming more restrictive because they would be putting an image through the USB port so you could uh, have a Linux ISO connected to your computer through your phone and they wanted SE Linux but they'd have to compile the kernel in a different way and have the patch and all that type of stuff is just becoming more and more of a nightmare and you're not able to do that. Mm -hmm. So Right now, I'm messing with a Linux phone. The, Do you guys agree with Stallman and GNU thinking for FSF philosophy at the, you know, in general, or sort of like you're more middle of the road about? It? I mean, I personally, I think there's there's a need for that philosophy. Um, I don't at least now i don't personally 100 percent dedicate my beliefs and actions to it right. um I, you know i'm not i'm and i'm not i'm not certain i'm not certain about anything to be honest <laughs> but i i'm not ready to say that that 
everything outside of it is um, has no place for me or has no place at all. Um, but you know, I I think about the commonalities. I think about you know, I think that there's some good. There's good that will come. There there's a there's a truth to it, um, and there's a good that it will do. Um, and there's certainly no reason to not offer. You don't have to agree that it's the only way to agree that it's to, there's something good about it. Um, that's my my point of view. I think that you have the philosophy, like the Emacs is a great example of an ecosystem that is informed and by that philosophy and it's an artifact of that philosophy. Because you look at an Emacs package, chances are, like if you look at any of the Zettel casting systems, they're not going to be trying to it's not going to be let's see you have org rome it's not rome because rome requires you to pay for a SaaS subscription and it's only accessible online is like any emacs package you use generally you're going to have all the data on your local machine and it's is that it's, I didn't know there was something called rome is that rome research is that what you're talking about uh -huh. yes yeah that's right i, I thought yeah, rome was just a a verb. Anyway, sorry. No, no, no. no. They, they built the interface to be like that. Yeah. It's interesting, right? Because, yeah, you throw, you hear all these terms and you don't always know. Like a lot of people are like, uh, you know, hyperbole has adopted this org thing uh, because they don't know it existed before org. Um, because the org obviously has a much broader reach right now. Um, so yeah, understanding that history and that Emacs is tied into the FSF philosophy, you know, there's probably a fraction of the Emacs users that even are very aware of that. Yeah. Um, but it, I, I think, yeah, Stallman, he's seen a lot and yeah he's somebody who does think a lot from first principles and is very logical. You know, he doesn't necessarily want to deal with parts of the world that exist. Um, but, you know, if he makes a statement, it's usually fairly true. Yeah. And uh, so the fact that he's concluded this and been very definitive about it for decades, you know, tells you that there's some truth in there that you should look into. Yeah, I think I think if we if I think of like today's earlier session where some of the questions were yeah, you know, exposed some tension there and, and I think one of the reasons why we see that tension is because of the success and the kind of the more broad appeal of that org mode has brought Emacs and it's just it's a healthy sign it's a sign that there's people coming into the community who may not be familiar with the the origins the the philosophical origins of the tools that they're using i also think that you have a lot of the people who are interested in emacs are probably interested in the free software foundation so it's something like the I philosophy i mean maybe but right they could just be interested in what which is what Stallman talks about too a lot. It's like you may just want the functionality that some software has, and you may not care about free licensing, but you should. And here's right. why, you know. So yeah, but you you start using don't. all the you start using all the packages, and then the philosophy then it kicks you into the philosophy from the reverse direction. And so I think is if you. If you start resonating with that philosophy, Emacs is the place to be. Well, yeah, so if you live we'll all be world. slanted towards wanting the GPL license or at least the BSD license because it's the place that ex it's the place in philosophy that exploits all those advantages. Yeah. Practically, yeah, it's interesting because maybe. I don't know how many years ago, 10, 15 years ago, there was that big debate about open source and versus free software. And, you know, it was just raging and it doesn't even seem like it's a topic anymore. It's like the, the GPL has done very well. Other licenses have too, but,
but the the model of software being free and open you know is is established at all levels uh in the economy and you know in the in the technical world so you know stallman is sort of playing the long game and uh what do, what do they say like uh the justice system bends towards right but it's over a really long period of time or so. uh, eventually it gets to the right answer i i think it's sort of like that you know is that we're going to have all these ups and downs but eventually you'll have dictators and such but eventually freedom will win out over you know being crushed under the boot like the russians are today you know what comes out of their society after they get crushed by the ukrainians uh i think will be hopefully for them uh you know because they they had such great intellectual capacity but they've had this broken culture for over 100 years and so if you don't uh, going back to engelbart again if you just evolve your technology without your process your culture uh you're left with something that may not work well at all for you you have to take stock every now and then you need that time and that's another that's another point that i wanted to make in my talk but i just couldn't find room for it is that if you know that you're gonna make that time in the future then you can focus on the present um but if you never make that time and and i i don't mean you know it, it could apply to anything but you, whether it's societal or technical but don't stop and and really think about what you are you know am i rep am i doing what i represent or am I, are my actions representing my myself and my needs and and my my goals um and every 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 person every organization of people every society should should really think about that and it seems like it just there there's certain ways that society can grow where it becomes you can't think about that because when you start to think about that is when you become vulnerable or you i don't know i'm not a, i'm not a philosopher i'm not a not a international uh scholar but does, does emax uh, rank up there on your hierarchy of needs it's like number two or uh <laughs> take that away from me and <laughs> my survival will be and as, much as I, and as much as my digital self is absolutely it's probably very close to i mean it i it it really did i think save me from from destruction in terms of uh organization personally i i think it was what was it it must have been 2008 or so i was just so disorganized and and i was uh, you know missing bills and, and things like that and just because i had a pile of papers and i said you know what i need a need to be able to take notes and I was taking notes but I had just a bunch of flat text files and I said I need to be able to collapse my text and I want to be able to take outline notes um, it's pretty... and ended up... sorry go ahead and I just ended up finding uh, I think it was work mode at the time I think it was still a separate package um, and I was like okay finally just this ability to collapse my notes into a hierarchical structure so that I could have one thing that I could think about multiple one file, think about multiple things, and collapse them when I didn't need to think about them anymore. And I was just like, okay, finally, this is the thing that's going to help me stay organized. Um, and from there on out, I mean, that's it worked. Um, so in terms of whatever I am today, uh, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't undo that anymore. I, I like that's committed to my, um, my, my identity at this point. So yeah, yeah. Now, have you looked at the great, great explanation of it, you know. That have you looked I at the you... org narrowing at all? Or yeah, oh, yeah. I do Emacs that a lot. narrowing stuff. Yeah, I do that a lot. Um, it helps me. It, it helped me focus on um, on writing some of my notes for the for the talk. Um, yeah, it, that's that's very important because uh, you can end up capturing so much. It makes it so easy to capture, and then you one day or said okay i captured too much i need to you know that outline having all those stars and whatever in your outline is can be very distracting um and i, and I use very old stuff so i still have you know just regular 
a, a series of asterisks aligned to my left um, my left side, so I have a lot of visual noise in there. But yeah, yeah. I mean, do you what? Do you have any special ways that you use it, like in terms of the narrowing or anything? Or? Uh, I like using the Vertico package because it allows you to set up different commands to either like be in a buffer or mini buffer or various things like that. So I can choose how to do that or change that over time. Uh, for me with Emacs, the thing that is the most useful about it is I generally like trying out new things. And Emacs is a program that got onto my computer, never left, because anytime I want to try something new, I can just try out the packages or parts of the configs or variables and I get to try that stuff out. Some stuff has stayed. A lot of stuff doesn't necessarily stay. Throw out my init the, files and... The, the first time when I'm bringing up a new system is I always like get some micro Emacs version just so I can edit my config files and then I get the OS stable enough and then I install GNU Emacs and it's like I never used VI I never learned VI uh, I was lucky I guess you know they taught us first year of college we used Emacs um, so uh, all these people I've uh, they, they've gone through seven to ten editors and I'm like well I've gone through versions of Emacs and that's it <laughs> so it's been a uh, a little different and it is it's crept into my subconscious you know so yeah. much so that it, the the talk about getting emacs uh using emacs to fill in your web form fields was very interesting to me because years ago i i, I did that we um when sun was popular there was also apollo uh which had a better networking and a better os um and so we were using some of their workstations and they had uh, every every shell and every uh, window uh, had an editing capability. It was essentially an editor field, but it was their own editor. So I I modified it so it was Emacs uh, in you know everywhere on Apollo, and it was a really beautiful environment. And like then HP bought them and killed the OS in favor of uh, HP UX. So that went away and I, I couldn't use it anymore, but we had built a, a really cool environment on there. But that, again, I wouldn't hand over the workstations. I was setting them up for a, a research team. And I wouldn't hand them over until I had built this environment so that they all had the consistent editing experience yeah. and they wouldn't go off and just do something random with it. Huh. It's funny. It's funny how you describe that, that bootstrap process because... The way that I think about it is that a lot of times you end up. Um, what, what's the what's the path that they talk about is that you you need to learn enough Bash to install Python um, or Ansible or something like that, and that's that's the you know that that's the joke is that that's the only amount of Bash that you need to know, but if you need you know, uh, you go to the Emacs path. You you mean you might not even need Python if you you mentioned having it installed to edit configs and things like that and edit what you need to do to get get another version of Emacs installed, but I could see, I would love, you know, maybe maybe that'll be my inspiration for next year's talk is to um, find a way that, yeah, everything, just use Emacs as a substitute for Python and Ansible. I could, I could probably use some of the packages that were out there, like, uh, um, what was it, like, um, his name, Anthony or uh, Tropin, Andrew Tropin, he, he had the uh, RDE, the reproducible Emacs. I could look at right. that and... <laughs> Use that to well, that's what kills me about living through we're always manipulating json now and i'm like why does javascript have such a crappy format it could just be s expressions and then we get rid of all this noise you know that we have to keep dealing with and uh and and it's, it represents the same things but instead we settled on this crappier thing that's a little closer to the way we would have done it in C probably, and you know because it is Java's JavaScript's object format, and it's like it's annoying to no end. And of course, you could write a processor so it converts bidirectionally, 
but no, nobody will do it. If you've ever uh, used Lisp uh, to replace your HTML, same sort of thing. You know, you don't have to deal with your closing tags and you get all the auto editing. And it's just like, even without abstracting above any of the tags, you know, just replacing them one for one, it's so much better. But can you yeah. get anybody to do it? You look at Gix and you have the init system that's written in Guile or uh -huh. scheme. And then it, you got the cron program, it's mcron, that's written in Guile. And it, like you can use the normal cron syntax for that or a different one where you can do that and you can start labeling it with like, say how many hours I want to do. I, I think the example they give in their documentation is like, I want it to do the first Wednesday of every month or you can put if statements in there or a whole bunch of interesting things like that. It's like you go their their package definitions are in Guile. So it's like the whole operating system is in Guile. Well, that's what they were trying to do, right? That was going to be the scripting language for uh, GNU uh, was going to be Guile. And they were doing that, which again, you know, this is all like from MIT, right? Installments from the MIT AI lab all this stuff scheme it's all evolved from that environment and you know they were right it, this stuff is uh, pretty good but it's like it's interesting to listen to him say you know if we were to update emacs and allow another language uh to be the the programming language it would be scheme <laughs> and you're like you know it's like it's not even on the radar of like anybody in the industry uh, to do that, but he doesn't care. He's like, he's an iconoclast. Uh, he sees the value. He sees what's technically good. If it, Have you ever read any of the, his compiler code or something? I mean, read his Emacs code. It's so clean. It's so beautiful. It's It's not like super abstract, but it's like, you know, even even the C code to implement the Lisp uh, primitives. I mean, now you don't know what he wrote versus somebody else, and you can see in Emacs that it's gone away from uh, the sort of stuff he used to write. But his mind is just like so clear when doing things like that. That like you can learn an infinite number of things from kind of looking at the way he structures stuff. I'm gonna have to. I'm making a note for myself to to go seek that out specifically because I don't think I've ever um, I've seen some of the code that he's written I've just never never seen it in in a in that context you know of, of specifically going in to try to get a sense of, right. of what right. is what he thought I, was, I mean when you read like read the Emacs manual right I, I mean at least uh, you know through version 19 uh, he wrote that right and it's like step by step he takes you you know, what a point is uh, to marks, to windows, to, and and it, it's just, it's very thoughtful. And you're like, well, he's been embedded in this for years. And like, this is second nature to him. He doesn't even think about it. But when he talks about it, it all comes out from first principle. And I think, uh, I think that's what made him uh, a master programmer. And some of the stuff that you know, they tried to do, you know, build an operating system from scratch, even though they didn't have all the success they wanted. But you look at how good they made the Unix tools uh, compared to what they were in Berkeley and elsewhere. And, you know, it's fabulous programming as well. I think very impressive. Cool. I, I, I know that he got, at least I saw some people praising that C manual that he recently published. Um, oh, I haven't seen that. Yeah. It was, I think it was uh, in the last, somewhere in the last year, probably more like six months, he released a, a, some kind of C um, documentation. Um, uh, so I, I would I wonder if he would ever consider doing something for, for ELISP or for Emacs or anything like that. Yeah, he did talk about, he that was one of the things he wanted, that, to update the Emacs list file. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think, I think the intro of it, if I remember. Oh, right. right. Chiselle's book, right? We wanted to uh, read yes. the intro. Yeah, you mentioned that book, yeah. I think the manual is pretty good, but yeah. I mean, there's there's so much to keep up with. I mean, Ellie is 
so productive and uh i mean the rate at which they're adding stuff to emacs is pretty and that i mean if you ever look at the developer list it's massive number it's same with org i don't know how people get anything done they have so many men and ehor processes like every message on there yeah. this must be his job to some extent because it, it just it would be so much time and like the hyperbole list there's nothing i mean there, you know it's no problem at all it doesn't take any time but mm -hmm. they have so many topics that people are talking about it's very impressive i don't i don't understand how they get by without a uh, like a tracking so a better tracking system i mean dev bugs is certainly good um but you know it's it not as uh I'm trying to find the right the, the the right words here without i don't like i'm not trying to insult it but it's you know a, like a like a backlog like a more kind of elaborate tracking system that le kind of like separates all right let's t put this in our backlog let's prioritize it let's right. analyze it but no, I think it the just comes in, well. and gets immediately handled and gets gets <laughs> resolved. Whether it's a whether it's a no or a yes, it things tend to be addressed and finished very quickly. So you're saying I, it's topics that concern me. I should bring up with them, and they'll actually get dealt with pretty quickly. What, whether it may, to your satisfaction or not, I think so. I, I, I <laughs> my my sense is in general that things don't things don't come in and then get like planned they come in and they get done or they don't get done ever um my my but, issues with the org i think i think they've done a lot of great stuff uh from a user perspective my issues have been with the way it was written uh was very sloppy code for a long time now they've spent a lot of time rewriting stuff so i think it's a lot better but i just i was looking at something the other day and it was clear that this should be uh, at least a separate function or abstracted out and it was all hard coded in the function. So I think they sort of do that on a piecemeal basis uh, because they've got a lot of legacy uh, code from the way it started. And they knew that it wasn't written the way they wanted, you know, like having to write a totally new parser is a good example. And yeah, we all go through that refactoring and stuff, but. I think it's because it was it was a quick and dirty solution for Karsten, you know, to solve the same way the web was, right? I mean, they just wanted they wanted a publishing platform for physicists. So now the guy who wrote that is a true genius. Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, you know, the the web inventor. So he took a, a broader approach to it. But basically they had to get something up fast and running and you know that just sort of proved the concept and then you had to have the whole engineering team at uh uh mosaic uh come in and actually you know do a lot more with it but they lost the original web had full editing capabilities like in wikis and they lost that almost immediately when they went to the graphical web and so we've been hurting you know, like I, every time I used to go when I was early days of the web, I'd look and I'd, I'd look at this form and I'd say, OK, so this is like you enter this data and then it runs this program and it does this thing. So how do I see what. What the program does, how does it process the form? It was never connected. The code was never connected to the form. I'm like, why? Why would you want the set of inputs that is totally disconnected from the way it's processed, right? There, it was hidden in the, the back end, right? Which you had no access to. And it's like, I guess, good for proprietary vendors, but, but it's like, so for engineers to understand the system, it, it was very, very difficult. What if I have a hundred forms? So I see, yeah, that there's like one function that's referred to in the form, but I don't know anything about that. I can't even see it's it's calling invocation a lot of times, right? So it's like, that's just broken architecture and nobody cared. <laughs> they just like, let it go on. And now was you there, have all these, what? I mean, was there an alternative to that? Did it, did it start somewhere else and then 
Well, you encapsulate it as like, you know, the processing is, is part of the form abstraction, that it's an active entity. And they can be separated if they live, right? Like you have the front end and the back end uh, piece of the form behavior. But, you know, maybe you want that abstraction to be able to migrate front end to back end across time. And so you need to have these, these two parts and we see this in building things now, right? What are we using? Uh, we're using TypeScript on the front end and we're using C Sharp on the back end. So I imagine there's some impedance mismatches going on around there, but we actually introduced a Python validation framework. I don't wanna get into this too much, but we are using those technologies and uh, we can share those now across the, the front end and the back end. And, uh, so you know a lot of languages that you need to understand and i just think so like closures right you, you're familiar with closures right so i mean that's that's what you're doing is you're passing around the environment um so that you can interpret uh the data properly because it's you have the closure which wraps around it and so many things get when you want to deal with unwinding state uh you know through many levels having the closures allows you to do that easily sort of the lexical binding versus the dynamic binding and and so you know the callback hell that they talk about in node.js is is reflective of not having a, a good closure based environment when you look at the most of the uh list based webs uh environments are closure based and they can do much more interesting application uh building without dealing with a lot of the plumbing uh than if they didn't have that interesting and when you refer to closures are you are you saying that that power there's a certain paradigm of form processing on the web that's more like a closure based solution that's right yeah if you look at the common lisp uh uh like hutchin toot and uh frameworks built on top of that and oh, you'll I mean see more like, I, I definitely will do that but i mean, I mean more like it, when you're talking about the kind of like the early days and and how like they separated like the the form from the the actions uh -huh. that were, are, are you saying that that's that's a situation where like something that would be like a closure is is more or are you just strictly right. talking about that would, that would help solve that problem i would say because it gives you you know sort of you're seeing some of it in react now they're like oh we've discovered components and so you know we only have to do partial updates now because we can like walk our tree uh and know that only the subcomponent you know and it's like, yeah, um, th by by building all these abstractions, uh, a, you simplify your state management a lot and you simplify that and you localize uh, where any of your issues can be. And so so if I have my uh, processing engine totally disconnected from my input state, you know, it's going to cause a lot of problems and you saw it in the early days of the web where everything was what was it cgi c yeah. is that what it was uh, right you just sort of you had a totally separate back end and, and there was just this very thin kind of connection uh to the front end and uh everybody's rediscovered they rediscovered sockets okay we need sockets and, and then everybody's fighting well I, I have to replicate the data on the front end and the back end. You know, just handling tables uh, is such a bear uh, on the web for similar reasons, right? So you had, uh, what was that company, Apollo, or that was one of their frameworks, who uh, was trying to do real-time uh, front end, back end uh, framework uh, so that you could do all these pushes to a million clients right, of any change, and you could get like real-time uh, updates. Uh, you know, that seems fundamental to me if you're gonna have a Facebook-like 
kind of environment. And you know, look at how much money Facebook had to spend to just build their basic application that scales at the level that they needed it. I mean, it's, you're, it's an impact. You're talking about hot reloading, right? Of data? Yeah. 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 Part, but but I'm talking about like how how it flows and where it's maintained and you know is there a single source of truth right that's what we really want so people try to push stuff to the back end but then you get all of this problem of uh, the front ends out of date so what's your method you keep web sockets open you know it's like well then I have too many of those and uh, so uh, yeah. And, and and what's your programming model for pushing all that data around anyway, right? When it, uh, pushing, polling, it, it's, it's complex stuff, but if you solve it, there's a guy who wrote uh, a, a web server, like tiny, tiny WB or something. I, I could look it up, but it's like, and he shows benchmarks of what he can process from this one like c-based program and it's like five times uh the speed of other 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 things just based on the algorithms that he implemented and uh so you know so you get your scale right like that and then you keep adding on some abstraction layers because now you can afford it uh and then you simplify your programming model and like we could be building the kinds of web applications that we want, you know, with menus even without, have you ever figured out how to do a good menu on a web app? You know, it's like, it's so much energy, right? When like in Emacs, it would be just, here's my menu item and I'm done. So I think the, the baseline of what your programming model is matters so much from the syntax down to like the the lexical scoping and you know and and we're just lucky that lisp got a lot of things right that we have that as sort of like the thinking man's programming environment while all these other people were stuffed into java uh you know in the 80s and they built uh java beans and and uh if you've ever looked at j2ee i mean that was such a monstrosity uh that it just collapsed literally of its own weight sort of i mean people are still using java but it's like nobody wants to field a new web app you know in j2ee it's just not done uh so it, unless you have you know a ton of legacy investment that you have to keep up yeah. so i i think these design choices matter a lot and i think apple's renaissance has been based on, you know, really saying, well, we'll iterate through our designs before we subject the users to them. We're not going to just make everybody one big beta test like Facebook or Microsoft. And, uh, you know, you see that like people have, you know, certainly in the consumer space have, you know, the shops are always full. I mean, wherever Apple store you go to and uh, you don't, you know, Microsoft is trying, Sony tries to have stores and stuff, but you don't, they're not filled with this traffic, you know, because people aren't attached to the design aesthetic the same way. True. Yeah. Yeah, they got something. They certainly have something that people want. Every, yeah, they, every program grows until it's a half a common Lisp implementation or it's got a mail server in it. Like you got those <laughs> two sayings. Uh -huh. Oh, have you seen uh, this at all? It's kind of like lets oh. you make desktop-like apps with Common Lisp. I like the name though, Omnificent GUI Builder. You're giving us a lot of great links today. Um, it's making me happy. I've stayed it's around. It's for a YouTube but... video, but they also have a GitHub page somewhere. Uh, I wish I did more. Uh... But this is uh, and this is pretty new too. This is all, about a half a year old only. Well, does it look decent? Uh, is it real or is it like? Well, it seems kind of like React JS, where you're not writing, where you're, it's not the eight the 
pure HTML post Git model where it's more like an application. And like if you look at the screen, like you have the applications, you can move them around like a desktop can be. Mm -hmm. Looks fun. Uh, it certainly looks functional. That's that's that would be my way to, to say it. And then you just write it in all one language. Yeah. Instead of it looks like small talk, like what their environment used to look like. Oh yeah, and that was the glorious you know, toolkit is the thing I was Well, there was a time when we had, you know, single UI builder environments. And then you would just say what theme you wanted, Windows, Mac OS, and instantly, you know, it would look like the other environment. And you had to do no work to get that. It's like, wow, that would be nice these days. Another thing with that philosophy of the copying the programs, it's, you had uh, Keanu Reeves talking about NFTs and it's like, it's like, what do you think about these NFTs with the matrix? You mean we're going to have a computer? Let's see. You mean we're going to spend all this stuff? You mean we're going to have... You want me to be on board with charging people for these digital things on a computer that's designed to make copies? <laughs> <laughs> it was the whole person just like completely stopped because they're trying to... Yeah. Showed you how the idea was fundamentally wrong. <laughs> yeah, get your get your baseline right. I mean, I it's I've like, had to, you know, I'm a, I'm very pro Ukraine, uh, and uh, so I've learned a lot more about Russian history. I also have a number of Russian uh, workmates who are very uh, nice people, but you know, they left Russia <laughs> as well, and. You know, a lot of what's going on seems to be uh, from decisions that were made eons ago, you know, uh, in uh, the back to the Mongols and the way they ran their system. So it's like when everybody says we've got to run so fast and we don't have time to really think through the design, they can't see the impact that that's going to have on their enterprise or anything else. And, you know, if you're a long-term person, you, you obviously have to do things fast enough so the company can survive, but, but you have to think about that strategic level as well. And Those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sometimes very badly. <laughs> uh, so how do we get, how do we get Lisp to be something again? You know, it's and people are worried about Emacs dying out. I don't think that's happening so much, but certainly Lisp, Lisp missed its position in web development. It seems, even though you know it can be quite capable there, but because of its uh, its image model and you know lack of sort of focus on threading, uh, it seems like. You can't get anybody to even look at it now, right? I, I, I mean, unless you're talking about closure, like you talked about. Yeah. Probably the, you're the, talking about how Scheme would have been a lot better for JavaScript <laughs> when JavaScript was first released, cause, yeah. or like Emacs, because Emacs is good for a platform for distributing apps versus mm -hmm. HTML's a document reader that they shoved applications into i like the way you describe things it's like, yeah i can't can't argue with that but it is interesting to me you know like uh a lot of people don't know uh certain systems that are list based that have been super successful right like uh, uh orbits uh was based on the technology of uh, a Cambridge company, right? That implemented the bulk of their uh, flight scheduling software in Lisp. And they had a, a very active uh, kind of Lisp community. Um, so, you know, it, it's Hacker still- Hacker News is another one. Hacker News? Yeah, that's that's built in Lisp. Uh, yeah, the person who founded it was using Lisp and 
Paul oh, Graham. Sam, Sam uh, Altman? Uh, Paul Graham. Oh, Paul Graham. Oh, he found it. Oh, I didn't know he was... Or at least he was guy. involved in it anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's either yeah, that or Reddit. Has, it was one or the other. He has had interesting Yahoo uh, shopping uh, right? yeah. experience where he, he wrote about that, how he leveraged Lisp to his advantage. So, yeah, you know, I think Python was that way until it got discovered. I actually, yeah. Used to, I worked with those guys back in Silicon Valley for a little while. And, uh, you know, when we were trying to show the world that Python was something good, but it hadn't been noticed yet. So oh. there's a lot, there's a lot, you know, of leverage that you can get if you, you're careful about it. Uh, one thing that I thought was interesting is you look at like the Google it's, did some survey of like, the most efficient programming languages to run. Mm -hmm. And you had like, I think C was like number one and you look at the list and the only one that even looks remotely high well, high level is common lisp. Mm -hmm. it's like uh, us right. sent per, or like the TDP or whatever that would be called, like sent per execution or whatever. And uh -huh. Everything else was more like C. Have you, have you heard of uh, Pico Lisp? Um, a little bit. On uh, Rosetta Code, where they write the different implementations of uh, 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 algorithms in different languages, look at any any sort of algorithm and the Pico Lisp implementation next to all the others, and it's like always super tiny. And you know you've got you've got just a ton more code and everything else. And then Pico Lisp is like Lisp with a database, maybe a triplet database uh, built in, and it's pretty small and efficient. Uh, but I don't think anybody uses it. Um, but it's an interesting example of like a special case uh, Lisp uh, that you can embed in other things, or you know use this like one guy in Germany has been doing it for many years. Is, so, is that the, um, is that like an internet rule or a, you know, a computing rule that we could come, come up with is that no matter what you could think of, no matter what you find, there's one guy in Germany, at least <laughs> who's using it. Doesn't matter. Who's already done it. Yeah. Well, I, I knew some Dutch people. I was in embedded systems at Motorola. We were working with very small microcontrollers with no memory, right? So we needed these super efficient cross compilers. Uh, to build anything for us. And this uh, company in Amsterdam, you know, seemed to have some skills. And so we started talking to them. And then we flew over there to do due diligence and check them out. And God, if they did not have like one of the most advanced software development operations I'd ever seen, you know, total quality assurance, great people. And but everything was like to the T. This is how we do it. Boom, 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 so that they could get like, you know, that's the only way you could get the efficiency out of compilers at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we, we worked with them, but it's sort of, they had that, uh, that German kind of uh, culture of uh, the fit and finish has to be uh, just so. So we used to, we used to have to do things like there was like 256 bytes of memory bytes yeah. there's no k in there uh of ram and so you would like you use overlays where you're repeating what you store in each uh word um at different times in the program and you had to manually like keep track of the lifetime of objects and it was a nightmare but uh, it was the only way to kind of squeeze uh, some of the stuff in there. And we started in Assembler, and then we went to C. And then we had this one time that was really fun that um, we had, God, I'm really dating myself now, but some of the people in product had these uh, terminals, like 12-inch terminals with 8-inch floppy disks on the terminal. And they were using those to... Uh, to interface to uh, the microcontroller boards for emulator boards, where we would test out new software, you know, for a board that hadn't been released to production yet. Uh, 
and we would we would be able to iterate on that and right next to these things were sun workstations that the engineers used for their normal development so i was moved from research to product and they said so this is how you're going to have to do your code on this monochrome uh, terminal and i'm like well what about using the the sun workstation and well it's just a serial port so we'll just like interface it no we tried that two years ago it didn't work can't do it I'm like i am not going to sit here and use this dumpy thing for like we so like that afternoon i like figured out the protocol and and got the thing the sun workstation talking to it and then i wrote like a, a disassembler tool so i could work uh the the assembly the math behind it at a higher level and i, I had all that going like the first week but people came over and they're like what i what what are you doing how how is this possible you know it's like they they just had started from that vantage point that they really had to live here and they hadn't done enough of an assessment. So, so I would just look back at that when people say, this is the only way to yeah. do something. You know? That's you one of the great things about computers is it can speak too many languages. So if you want to just speak Lisp, you can just speak Lisp relatively anyway. Or so if, you, maybe if, we, call, if we said, if Lisp, everybody else wants to speak, uh, bad, uh, worse language that you don't like as much, you don't necessarily have to speak that. We'll call I guess it except for the www, but anyway. Omnificent web development language. <laughs> and, and tell everybody that this is the be all and all. I think what I like the most about that is that I, I don't believe that omnificent is actually a word. So they can't be accused of being incorrect because the, there is no definition of, of omnificent that they can be shown not to conform to. I, I could be wrong about that, but that's that's. There's a it. Latin word. That's why you know what it means is because omni is everything. Fish is, mm -hmm. Efficient is something about like knowing or everywhere. Like the all knowing that's, GUI builder. I mean, that's how, isn't that kind of how you read the omnificent? <laughs> I think that's, that's actually omniscient. I think omniscient. Oh, omniscient. Yeah, yeah. That's right. so you're close. I think. Yeah. But you, yeah. C L O G. So it's the clog builder. <laughs> that sounds like a lispy kind of thing. You know, it doesn't have any sexiness to it. But we we've invented the clog builder. <laughs> You know, that, that's funny. That was another thing I wanted to mention when I was it's writing. It's just this. to clog how everybody else does things, to just clog it up. Like, no, you don't we have to do it that way. With ours. That guy's up. Isn't, isn't, is, that, is that something that is real? That, like, I, I feel like a lot of Emacs users are, or maybe just the, that type of person in general. That do what? We want, we want things that look bug, not look but sound like clog we prefer things that are awkward and <laughs> are, are are you know uh, stupid acronyms and if it seems like effort has been put into something to make it sound <laughs> sound slick or, or market or anything it's like, I'm like i don't uh, know i'm not sure i think that goes yeah. back to this like what i was talking about with the scrolling down it's like i want it to not have animations that's just spending cpu cycles to make my experience worse yep, yep. and to, like why would i want to be scrolled down half a line so i can read half of a text well if, your finger, if you scroll half of a finger that's what it would be if you just do this oh is this the guy i think this is the guy the one the g toolkit yeah the glamorous toolkit i read about this a while ago this was like one google guy maybe he had a team and then I think he left Google and he, he's trying to do it. Implemented in Faro, the pure object oriented language. Yeah, this sounds like one of those. Yeah, things. that's what but, it is. You know, there's, yeah, it's like just get the base right, right? That's what Lisp did. Just give me car and cutter and uh, Lambda calculus. And, and I will move I'll the world. Go for, what? And I will move the world. Yeah. Well, when you think, you know, I mean, look at the opportunity that was lost with list machines. I was around for those two. I'm, I'm near dead, I guess. Um, but um, 
I was young at least then. And um, they, they micro-coded Lisp, right? So everything atop that was Lisp. <laughs> the window system was Lisp, you know, sort of like what Jobs was trying to do. He was trying to do, uh, I don't know, well, when he did display PostScript or he was trying to get common experience at different levels. But like, if you really have a consistent programming model across your whole damn system, you know, it's probably uh, thousands of man years of uh, work that you just eliminate right there. If you have a decent language, right? And then a debugging environment. I mean, we still use stuff that there is no debugging environment for it, right? Um, because it solves some problem that exists in the industry and we haven't gotten gotten rid of it yet. Uh, I mean, I want to set up some Raspberry Pi lights. And if you have like that with an embedded controller, if you run that with Lisp, you're probably going to get a REPL for free that is going to allow you to remotely control your lights. But, you know, they have micro Python for that. Um, if you're into Python at all, uh, that that was a physicist. I don't know if he was German, but uh, a physicist who implemented that to do uh, controller hardware. And it's pretty good. It uh, he's moved a lot of uh, I think they actually got money behind it and then uh, started uh, moving all the libraries into that, too. So that and you got pretty well. stuff That's like normal. C Python too, but I think part of the thing that makes Python appealing to people is you got all these uh, libraries that people can use to build their apps with. And if you're running Micro Python or C Python, do you have access to those? And... Right. Well, that's what I'm saying. They like have been moving on that to get a lot more of the libraries available because at first, that's right, that was part of what they were lacking. But just, uh, you know, being able to put your language at the hardware level without a separate operating system is kind of an interesting concept, too. And at that time with the Lisp machines, they were making the CPUs in line with, you had somebody making CPUs specifically for the Lisp machines. And like for ever since then, we've always been making CPUs to specifically target C. And I wonder how much that, Kind of like the philosophy does, uh, and artifacts that you design. I wonder how if like CPUs would look different and they stuff like that because we'd be optimizing them for lambda calculus or something and REPLs and if that would result in anything different. Well, I, I always ask my, my friend in London who knows everything or he knows something about everything. Uh, why... I remember the fastest computer I ever used was a DEC Alpha um, in the 80s. Uh, and it was, or maybe the beginning of the 90s. So it was a 64-bit machine at the time, and it used SCSI disks. And I would, you know, com compilation took a while of programs, but I would go to compile and I would just see these messages fly by me. And it would be like go is today right It'd be done in an instant and like how is that possible i go over to this other machine and they were they were emulating i thought it had 128 bit data path but we looked it up it was 64 bit but they did have 128 bit words and you're talking about like boot up speed and like how fast when you press a letter g on a keyboard how fast it appears on your screen and stuff like that right no, compilation of a complex uh, application. How long that would take and how long I would have to wait. And it was near instantaneous in many cases. And I had never experienced that before. So their disks were super fast. Uh, the, the throughput on the data buses was super fast. And I mean, it just worked like if you wanted a fast computer, this it felt right and i've not you know despite all the hardware i've had access to i haven't had that same experience on any other machine today. i know the zig programming language has recently gotten an incremental compiler for it nice so it would yeah, they're doing good work earn, they're doing 
Have you seen V Lang too? That's sort of interesting. Uh, I've seen that bit. a little bit, but I haven't John, looked too much like into this. it. This is one Russian guy, uh, and he's building his own Go like a replacement for C because he likes Go a lot, but he wants to solve some other problems that he didn't like in Go. And the things he says about it are incredible. It doesn't, well, it didn't have garbage collection at first, right? Because he wants to do all those machine level things, but he, there, they seem to be able to build things that they promote as doing a lot, like, like an entire web framework they have already. They have uh, their own graphics system and, you know, should be able to do very fast compositing uh, who knows you know and so a lot of people say that he's over promising but he keeps delivering these snippets about well v originally he had to translate v to c to get it to compile now it's self-hosting and he can compile the whole language in 1.8 seconds from start right things like that and and so he's bootstrapping these super efficient things to get to uh, a, a very Rust-like uh, systems programming language, but potentially uh, cleaner. But it doesn't have, you know, people behind it like Rust. And, and you don't know if what he's saying is actually true, but if it is, you know, it might be like Zig and be something really interesting. Zig uh, did a uh, cached compilation. So if you compiled something and then you change a little bit and you compile it again, you're not going to compile very much. Right. So it'll be super fast that way too. Yeah, I mean, memoization, that's caching if you can do it right. <laughs> I'll save, save your ass every time, right? That's sort of... Yeah. Then they have a self-hosted compiler. So I think that's one that will do the incremental co compilation. So like that, that one will just be much faster and give you more uh, debug stuff. But it is interesting. It's like, yeah, start with the REPL, right? Can you do a REPL in your language or not? Can you give me an interactive environment, even if everything has to be compiled? Like Julia, I guess, is going for some of this, right? They're taking some from Lisp. Uh, they're taking all these efficient scientific libraries, and they're trying to meld them into uh, a functional environment that gives you the most efficient code for any line that you write, right? Because it, it it compiles it based on the dynamic types or something uh, that it experiences. So um, it's very have interesting. You, have you seen the Janet Lisp language? It's kind of like V where it's a very small language that has a web framework for it as well. No, I haven't seen that. I got a link on it right there. Yeah, I see it here, Janet Lang. Not too hard to find. I like their logo, 1950s uh, Janet. Functional and imperative programming language runs on Windows, Linux, Mac OS, BSD. Entire language is less than one megabyte. This sounds like uh, Rebol, uh, called Sasserath, uh, did a lot of fourth. And then he wrote Rebol, which has now evolved into Red Lang. Uh, it doesn't seem like a great language, but it's like, it's got that fourth efficiency and it's super small with its super small graphics, but it's, you know, not that easy to write, I think. This is cool. This sounds really interesting. So who's doing this? Janet, you know where it comes from? Uh... Download source. They don't have about. Um, Tell us about Janet. <laughs> Janet Doc. Oh, Calvin Rose and contributors. So again, we have one guy <laughs> and contributor. <laughs> that's well, you know, that's modern. That's how it is. You know, we talk about yeah. repeating the cycles of and how uh -huh. how old problems are gonna are gonna manifest with new technologies. Maybe maybe that's the problem that we're doing is that and now everyone will have their own language and their own system. It has become so satisfying and easy to do that that every single person will write their own programming language right. have their own architecture and everyone will become it's like a, it's like a monkey's paw or the genie granting you a curse uh -huh. 
everyone will become perfectly competent and uh, at this stuff, but not be able to <laughs> communicate with each other because everyone's has their right. own personal language. It's like the the new Tower of Babel. You know, that's the claim that like my my guy in London makes about Lisp uh, that it's so efficient in making DSLs that um, nobody can communicate with each other. And I've heard that said about groups uh, working in Lisp together. But I've never seen it, and it doesn't make a lot of sense to me because if you build your DSL for the domain, well, then it's like if people have any concept of the domain, it's going to be quite understandable. And because it's representative, you know, form, follow, function, uh, they're not going to struggle with it. It's only if you, like, you know, make up terms that don't relate to anything and you use that all over. Or if you take the scientists and they use their single character variable names, that's going to be a lot less understandable than something tailored for the domain that you're working in, right? Good point. Yeah. I wonder. I wonder how much of it has to do with going back and forth. You know, like if you can't mm -hmm. spend all of your time or dedicate a long enough time, if you just go in and look at the, whatever this DSL, right. it's is different. And right. Switch right. back to idiomatic stuff. It's like, oh, you know, my brain. Is you have to context switch all the time, maybe. You well, had this Raku talk that was like the best talk for free software, or and one of the observations they made was that most of everything was made by one person, and if, even if you look at a lot of the projects that have more have more than two people, it's you have one person, oh, really? and then a maintainer takes over, and so it's still really one person working on it and it's like that's going to be like like 95 percent of everything out there it's, well to me that's so, a bandwidth and everybody problem, chooses right? a language that's not for that purpose and this was kind of the law of what they were so if you're going to be doing that you want to if you're going to be working on a project over a long period of time you want a language that has more features that you can master over a long period of time rather than how fast you can write hello world that can keep you interested in a, over a long period of, like Emacs, for instance. E Emacs can keep you interested in it for decades. Yeah. And it's good to know. I think it's, it's a cognitive know. mismatch. Go ahead. It's good to know that when given the freedom, like in software being such a new technology, uh, to do whatever you want, uh, that humans will still recreate the Tower of Babel. Um, every single time, <laughs> right? We'll never, we'll never be able to agree on what's a, a good or right looking language or, uh, you know, but I think the reality is that there are better ones, right? Like, like I think languages, uh, um, uh, written languages without accent marks are fundamentally better than those with accent marks. And so if you're stuck on one with there, you know, you're probably going to get left behind, you know, even though you can produce the same meanings. And I think, you know, languages without uh, Lisp type macros are never going to be able to solve the problems, even though they're computationally equivalent, uh, mm -hmm. that, that Lisp uh, people attack because you know they just can't wrap the complexity in their mind enough you'd have to have somebody who's a hundred times better uh with the weaker language uh to do what the you know the essentially average uh list guy leveraging the macro capability could do huh. like in in hyperbole one of the things that we solve that like you can't do uh I think very well in other languages or so we we have uh, uh, our implicit button definitions look like regular defunds, um, but they have two parts in them. Uh, one, which is the pattern match. Am I in the right context? And then the one that uh, calls the action. Um, but you need uh, so to make it look the same, like you're only there's only one path that you're running through this code, even though you have to do the pattern matching uh, when 
you're called one time and you have to do the action invocation when you're called another. There's a macro that we created called the HACT, H-A-C-T. And, and the macro actually uh, takes, uh, takes a, 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 there's, a, there's a, a function that it uses that's implicit that is set to different values at different, you know, at different states in the program. So when when you're just looking for the pattern matching, uh, that's that's all it does, and it sort of drops through the other behavior. And then when it comes back around, and uh, you're not doing pattern matching anymore, it, uh, um, it it executes the action. But looking at the code, you only see that one to fun straight kind of path. Uh, through it, so the uh, the engine handles all that, and I, I don't think you could write anything quite like that without without the macro. It's a, it's magical. It's the closest, probably yeah. the closest thing to magic that it, that we have, I guess. I don't know. Well, yeah. you guys have filled up my brain, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna yeah, I gotta get some sleep too. Uh, yeah, you 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 deserve it. Um, I'm I'm a day ahead of you in that respect, so I'm <laughs> amazed that you've made it this long, to be honest. Um, but I don't know if I did. I was there any like, is there anything Take in the home. pad or anything that you guys had had that I had neglected or anything that that I, I should? Well, I don't know. On to no, but I'm going to sign off. It's been a real pleasure talking to you guys. And uh, John, I'll I'll get in touch about you know, give you a chance to take a look at hyperbole a little bit and then we could talk about, you know, how you could feedback some stuff or if you want to interact with uh, meet some of the other guys in the team sometime and just talk. Yeah, any of that. Yeah. And you've got I think I mean I, I I'll email you if I if, or you email me email me either way. Um, okay. And a uh, plasma strike if you're interested, it's open too. I mean we need uh, smart people like yourself uh, uh, with lots of ideas and understanding mm -hmm. of where things come from uh, to to just help out on that. If you have any cycles and you want to get involved, let me know. Uh, my uh, my uh, email address is all over the hyperbole code, so easy to find. Just rswagnu.org will work as well. Yeah, if yeah, and, and either of you guys feel free to. If you have any interesting ideas or anything, reach out and email me. I, I'm on the I'm on the talk Thanks description. Thanks so much. I, I can't wait till they get this uh, session and they're like, wait, it's 180 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> what did these, the even bag got out of control, I guess. <laughs> but, well, you know, you they'll want to re keep this because it's a great wide ranging conversation for posterity. I have a feeling they won't run all of it through uh, through voice recognition. It, it, it definitely belongs with a 10-minute talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you this, and I not to not to prolong things, but this is this is very representative of the amount of time that I and the the proportional amount of effort and time that I spent preparing for this 10-minute talk. Because for <laughs> I'll tell you something that first is when you realize that you have a 10-minute talk and you say, "How am I going to get 10 minutes?" Then you start to <laughs> right. and you start and how you wind up with a hundred minutes, and then it takes you ten times as long to cut out to choose which ninety minutes to cut out. So <laughs> this is this is appropriate. It's appropriate for me. This is like my bookend that I can talk for three hours about that, yeah. or at least starting with that. Time. Get in. You should give a talk about that, sort of like how Michelangelo <laughs> went from the piece of marble to the David, and it's like. You know, I had this infinite amount of material and coalescing it to 10 minutes is a hundred hour effort because it's really I might. true. I might because that's, that's, that's a lot of what these tools do is they allow you to capture your stuff. They, they allow you to organize it and they allow you to formalize it. And that organizing part is the, is what, what gave me. Well, isn't, the, isn't that what they say that a professional programmer is somebody who will spend an hour, uh, Automate, uh, spend a hundred hours automating something that uh, only takes an hour, one time. I think that's what. <laughs> I think maybe some professional programmers may say that. I don't know if their bosses would agree. 
<laughs> There's some truth to it, though, right? Yeah, so weekend. have a great night, guys. Appreciate yep. it. Take, Take it care. easy. And uh, yeah, and plasma strike. I don't know if you if you do end up posting anything of your of your setup or anything. If you feel like it, just hit me up if you're interested. Anyone should looking at it because if you do, I'd I'd be interested. That's all. No pressure. Yep. Uh, all right. Take it easy. Great, great meeting you. Great talking to you. Yep. You too. Yeah. See ya. You are currently the only person in. The